Volume 4. The Boy's Choice. Prologue. A long time ago, gods existed in this world. One of them, a god named Christian, came down to man's land. Christian transformed his own godly powers into thirteen swords. One of the swords, the knight sword was used by himself while the remaining twelve were granted to the twelve people who swore their loyalty to protect him. These twelve swords were later on called as the Promise Swords. Then, Christian became the first king of Salvel and he was given the posthumous title of Knight King. During his time, he created a room called the Knight King's Study. This room was in the heart of Salvel's royal castle. It was surrounded by walls and had no doors or windows. Only the reincarnations of the Knight King could enter here through their dreams. One of the reincarnations, the king who smelt of rain, Gunshot King Ledger laughed as Letty asked him how to make it rain. When do you need it? Immediately. Ledger sat roughly on the chair, placed his elbows on his knees, and rested his chin on his palm. His lazy, arrogant look was exactly that of a king. Then, it's impossible. I had to practice a year and I was afraid my senses would go awry that I did not dare use any other swords aside from the gale winds. You used the gale winds? Not the water mirror? The twelve promised swords are contained within the body of the Night King. One of them has the power over water, the sword of water mirror. However, Ledger clearly said that to call rain, the sword of gale winds was to be used. I thought of the same thing and practiced with the water mirror, but it was an utter failure. It can control water but it cannot create water out of nowhere. And even if there is water, making it into rain was impossible. All I could do was to make a muddy waterfall. Letty had been aware of this fact. The fact that all of the kings she had met here were desperately honing the powers engraved in their souls out of necessity. They were all different to her who was living in peace. Then, continued Ledger, when I met a king further in the future, I asked him there was a way to make it rain, he told me to use the winds. Winds? Call cool winds high up above the sky, then call warm and wet air near the land. Do these and rain shall fall. He said there was a theory working behind this, but he could not explain it well. To make it rain, she should call cool winds up above the sky and warm and wet wind near the ground. The difficult part was calling the cool winds up above the sky, so high that it could not be reached by your consciousness. I do not know what you are going to use it for, but I highly recommend doing something else other than make it rain. There was a forest fire threatening to burn the land. If she could not make it rain, then she could only accept that, and give aid for the recovery of the damaged land and the affected people. And that was how things should be. Letty did possess supernatural powers, but these powers were never deemed necessary during her time. Therefore, she should just do what a normal human being could. But still, voices were ringing inside her head. There are lives you can save and you have the power to do so. What is wrong with using that power? Maybe I have talent and accomplish the feat within three days what took you a year. Now, that is confidence. I really like that part about you, Queen Letitia. Thank you, nonchalantly said Letty. And that cold part too, added Ledger. Letty ignored this last comment and asked him a question instead, so there is another king who made it rain aside from you? No. He only knew the workings, but could not do it. The only ones who can are probably me and the kings before me. The reincarnations of the Night King before Gunshot King Ledger were one-armed King Oswald, Letty, Administrative King Karl Heinz, Lion King Alexander, and so on. Indeed, as long as they practiced, they could possibly make it rain. But was that not the same with the kings of the future? Every time I come here, I always feel this big difference between my powers and that of Old Lion King. Have you ever had the same feeling? Letty thinks she was the inferior one compared to Ledger since she was living in a peaceful age. But Ledger was not referring to the skill of using their powers, but of the power of the Night King itself. I may have noticed this because I am one of the later kings. I think we lose some of our powers with every reincarnation. Ledger thinks this is fair. Because as they go through time, a power different than magic is being born. It is natural if they lose something. Queen Letitia, do you know what a gun is? No. The word is yet to exist in my time. Really? I think there already exists something similar to it. Maybe it was called differently. Ledger tilted his head on one side, wondering what it was called before. Anyway, the gun is like the magic of the new era. All you have to do is aim and shoot. It can take lives faster than a bow and arrow. I noticed its potential earlier than any nation had and ordered it to be improved to make it usable for anyone, anytime, even when rain is pouring down. All they have to do was to pull the trigger. This gun was completed and Ledger showed its prowess during the battle when he made it rain on the battlefield. And in exchange for that, I cannot use much of our power. The sky cracked. The earth split. The mountain collapsed. Ledger knew from his visits in the Night King's study that these supposedly exaggerated tales of Salvel's past kings were not exaggerations but mere truths. So he tried to do these same things in his time, but he could not. He practiced and practiced and the most he could do was to make it rain. Every time I speak with Old Lion King, 
I feel like I am speaking to someone from a myth. I may have the same power of the Night King, but I am not someone from a fantasy. Ledger sounded like he was declaring a war. Against what? Most likely against his own future. The mythological age ends with one-armed King Oswald. I will make a brand new age, Queen Letitia, he boldly declared. Gunshot King Ledger was the king who pulled the trigger making the gunshot paving the way for the new era. Chapter 1. The Promise of Dawn. A few days ago, Salvel's first princess Letitia attended the wedding of Ilstra's third prince Severio, and Princess Charlotte, a daughter of a Duke of Salvel and she was Letitia's first cousin. The visit was supposed to be a simple one. She only had to smile at the other guests. However, a few days before the ceremony, Charlotte eloped with her secret lover, leaving Letty to act as the substitute bride. Aside from that, she also had to deal with Duke Northruth who was trying to expose the identity of the fake bride. In the end, her whole time was taken up by addressing these little troubles. But despite all that, Letty was able to overcome all the hurdles and the wedding ceremony proceeded without any other incident. After the ceremony, Letty was planning to head straight home to Salvel, when Duke Northruth came chasing them in such a hurry. He informed her that Mount Grand was burning. Upon hearing the report, she immediately changed her destination from Salvel to Mount Gran. Letty's party had changed their destination, but it did not mean that they would have to change direction. Mount Gran was located to the north of the main road leading to Salvel's capital. During this time of the year, the mountain range prevents the heat wave coming from Ilstra to reach Salvel and Northruth. However, once in a few decades, a strong heat wave comes and it goes over the mountain. The damage dealt by this phenomenon is always big. It is supposedly sunny, and yet the sky is dark, muttered Letty as she looked at sky from her carriage window. She noticed how high the ashes from the fire had risen up the sky and could not help herself but think what might happen if she called a wind strong enough to blow them away. Your Highness, a messenger from the capital, declared Duke Barchet, Letty's first knight. I guess this was bound to happen. Her knight's call disturbed her from her reverie. She told him she would listen to the messenger while they took a short break from the travel. She went out of the carriage to tell everyone to rest as she went to meet the messenger. Astrid. Your Highness. It has been a while, energetically greeted the young knight as he bowed his head. The messenger sent by the Royal Chivalric Order was none other than Astrid Gall. I have come with a message for your highness. The Royal Chivalric Order has been dispatched to help in the search of Princess Charlotte. But if your highness party is already here, then it means the ceremony is finished, am I correct? Yes, you are. We have found Charlotte and the wedding ceremony finished safely. The couple had their happy ending, explained Letty with a wry smile. I see now that the news is yet to reach the capital. While in Ilstra, they had sent an express to Salvel detailing about the happenings with Charlotte's elopement. Of course, Salvel would send out men to help search for Charlotte, but it was only now that the report about this reached Letty. And considering the distance between the two countries, this was the fastest information could travel. Astrid, go and return to the capital. Report about our success in retrieving Charlotte and then, Letty stopped midway. She considered sending Astrid back after she had confirmed the status about Mount Gran. They were both passing through the mountains, sending him after knowing the situation was more efficient. You passed by Mount Gran on your way here, correct? Did you see any fire? I did not see a fire from where I passed, but I did feel the heat wave. The people staying at the inn by the main road, however, were talking about it. This meant the fire was not big enough to be noticed yet. Letty felt relieved. The fastest they could reach the mountain was tomorrow, and by that time, the fire might already be under control. Come with us until Mount Gran tomorrow. Afterwards, I will send you back to the capital to report about Charlotte and the situation of the wildfire in Mount Gran. I understand. I know you are tired from your travel, but I am counting on you. The only topic remaining was of a personal matter. Letty stole a glance to her newly gained knight and thought of telling Astrid about it since he was somehow connected to it. The following is a personal message to Commander Johannes. Could you relay it for me? Tell him I have successfully gained Vice Commander Craig Bard as my second knight. It was all thanks to his advice. Eh, shouted a flabbergasted Astrid. He did not even hear the latter part of Letty's message because he could not hide his surprise. His jaw dropped. Letty wondered at Astrid's reaction and came up with a conclusion of her own. Craig had always been at the border, so you have probably never met him. Ask Duke to give you an introduction. Letty called Duke and left the rest to him. Duke was listening to their conversation from a distance and he knew the exact reason behind Astrid's shock. It was not due to the surprise of seeing the vice commander, nor was it because the Craig Bard agreed to be a knight of the round was unbelievable. It was actually quite simple. He just wanted to say, am I not enough to be your highness knight? And Letty was the only one who did not understand it. Surprised, asked Duke. Just continued doing your best, said Duke as he patted Astrid's shoulder, an act that could be either out of pity to the younger knight or out of confidence. I was. Thought so. I was surprised, too, when her highness told me the name of her second. 
She wanted that Craig Bard. Duke thought it was impossible, but no. Letty easily had that difficult night eat out of the palm of her hand. It seemed that being a knight charmer runs in the royal blood of Salvel. And this was also my first time seeing the vice commander. Of course. Let me introduce you. Oh, I'm nervous. I mean it's that vice commander. My seniors describe him as a knight wearing strictness and nobility as his uniform. I had the same thoughts, but he was unexpectedly, paused Duke and decided to drop it. Forget about it. It doesn't concern you anyway. Just like Astrid, Duke thought at first that Craig was the epitome of seriousness and nobility. In fact, when he heard from Letty she wanted Craig as her second knight, he thought their positions were reversed. At present, Craig is Duke's superior in the order. However, in a few years, this will be reversed in Letty's Knights of the Round. Duke, as the first seat knight will be Craig's superior as the second. He is asking me now to learn and get used to it, but it's just impossible. This was the main reason why Craig sometimes speaks to him formally, and as if mocking him, asks for his opinion or even lets him make the decision. Duke thought he would keep up with this act if Craig was actually thinking of the future, but he was certain the older knight was just making fun of him. How could he be so sure? Well, the usually taciturn Craig had a certain twinkle in his eye whenever talking to him. That old geezer. The Order's top-ranked men, namely Johannes and Craig, had a habit of playing with the young ones. Duke swore he would never be like them as led Astrid to Craig. Vice Commander, may I introduce to you one of our new recruits this year? Knight of the tenth rank, Astrid Gall, sir, saluted Astrid as he bowed deeply at Craig who staring at him curiously. Ah, you are that, started Craig. He already knew Astrid's name, which was not surprising since Astrid was already quite known even during his days in the Knight Academy. He was dubbed a genius that only comes around once every few decades. Do you know Kielf Empire's young hero, General Valery Kiryakov? General Valery Kiryakov? I'm sorry, but I do not know much yet about other countries. I see. Your accent becomes evident if you say something from your native tongue. Craig had come to a conclusion on his own and then left as he encouraged Astrid to do his best for Salvel. This was the part where Astrid was supposed to be ecstatic and yet his expression said otherwise. Astrid? Duke asked the young one what was wrong. He could not help but be suspicious of Astrid due to his strange reaction after greeting Craig. He's the third person. I guess, people who know will notice it. The first person who knew Astrid was not of Salvel was one of his teachers in the academy. He was able to guess he was from another country just by talking with him for a while. The second person was Her Highness. She had clearly stated he was not from Salvel because of his polished accent. And now, was Vice Commander. His accent when he said a Kielvin name did not sound like how a Salvelian would pronounce it. What's wrong, Astrid? Something that doesn't concern you, replied Astrid, envious of the fact that Duke was a pure Salvelian. But Duke did not take it that way. You're being impertinent lately. Duke previously thought Astrid's puzzled look made him an adorable junior, but he would not be fooled now. Because of you, I'm starting to think Her Highness is adorable. This is the end of me. What's wrong with that? Her Highness is really charming. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. She's charming. I get you. Astrid kept on insisting Letty's charm and Duke just treated him nonchalantly. The party arrived at the foot of Mount Grand facing North Ruth before noon the next day. The foot of the mountain served as the evacuation site so it was bustling with people, of course, it was not in a good way. I'm surprised you did not run away. The young Duke of North Ruth, August Karl Zen North Ruth, who arrived earlier, greeted Letty and her party. Back at Ilstra, they both considered each other as enemies, but on this situation with the fire on him to Gran, they were now allies. Letty was surprised and thought Duke North Ruth could have welcomed her in a better manner like saying he was glad she had come, or he was in her debt. But then again, that villainous line suits you well that I cannot even complain about it. Anyway, time is of the essence. Please explain the current situation without the sarcasm. Letty went down the carriage immediately and stood beside the walking Duke Northruth. The fire at Mount Grand calmed down once, but another fire started again last night. We can say now that even if we extinguish the fire at present, we still cannot let our guards down. I see. How about the heat wave? The heat wave is, paused Duke Northruth as he moved from where he stood and then suddenly a strong, warm wind blew that made Letty's long, beautiful hair dance with the wind. Oh, he is being considerate now. He protected her from the heat wave. As you see, correct, said Letty as if finishing the statement for Duke Northruth. Thank you, I appreciate it. Humph, snorted Duke Northruth. Duke Northruth led Letty to a house comparatively bigger than the other houses in the small village. He did not even excuse himself upon entering and simply went inside. Let me greet the owners of the house. There's no need. When I told them the fire might reach here, they ran away immediately. We may use it as we wish. I see. Then I shall do as you say. They were brought into a room that the family probably used as a parlor. 
There were several chairs and one big desk where a map with several pins was laid out. Letty looked at the map and pointed at one of the pins. Is this where the fire started? And the number beside it is the date when it happened, asked Letty and continued on tracing the undulations of the wind on the map with her neatly trimmed fingernails. Ilstra's heat waves blow this way. You can read maps, asked a surprised Duke Northruth. And sea charts as well, added Letty. I see last night's fire started on a bad place. Three points are important about wildfires, namely, the starting point, fuel, and wind. The starting point is where the fire started. Most common natural causes of wildfires are lightning strikes and extreme dryness and friction. Fuel refers to the plants in the mountain, or in other words, the combustible materials. If these were wet due to rain, then there was no risk of the fire spreading. But if they were dry, they become the best fuel for the fire. Lastly was the wind. Strong winds can blow up the fire and aid in speeding up the rate the fire spreads. Duke, try predicting what can happen in three days. You have experience in dealing with wildfires, have you not? Duke looked at the map as Letty had asked him. He did not even bother asking how she knew about his past dealings with a wildfire because he had already accepted the fact that his master had an immense capacity to store information inside her head. The fire started at the eastern side. If this situation keeps up, the heat wave will fan the fire, slowly spreading up to the mountain. Once it reaches the summit, all that's left is for it to go down. The fire will spread at a quick rate to reach the foot. What can we humans do? asked Duke Northruth. Pray for rain. Or make a buffer zone. Cut down the trees that act as fuel to the fire and carry them away. That way, the fire will stop for a while. But the possibility of the heat wave carrying away sparks of the flame and scattering it in the area is still high. The buffer zone can only give us some time. One of the biggest threats of a wildfire is the shower of sparks. The flame is blown by the wind, spreading the sparks everywhere. The dry, strong wind blowing from Ilstra, the heat wave, completes the recipe for a shower of sparks. Where is the best place to make the buffer zone? asked Letty. Around here, replied Duke as pointed out the location on the map. The northern side is a rock formation and this close by the main road. This will make the work relatively easier, and we do not have to make a long buffer zone because of the rock formation. Duke Northruth looked at the young knight Letty brought with her. Like master, like knight, thought the Duke. Duke Barchette was just like his master. He was not just good-looking, he was also level-headed and could make a good assessment of the situation. No matter how much I think about this, I'd prefer this one, commented Duke North Ruth as he looked at Craig, then Duke, and finally Letty. Letty did not immediately comprehend what the Duke was pertaining to, but when she did, her expression turned sour. No, that was just, oh, never mind. Could you not complain about other people's tastes? Duke could not understand this exchange between Letty and the Duke, so he stole a questioning glance at Craig who clearly looked like he was having fun at the situation. Vice Commander, what are they talking about? Let's just say I once had the honor of taking someone else's role. Duke tilted his head on one side, wondering what this meant. Then they heard a knock on the door. Please excuse us, Lord August. Kielf Empire's ambassador has arrived. Letty and Duke Northruth turned tense upon hearing Kielf Empire. Show him in. Now all the representatives of the three countries are here. The three countries, namely the Kingdom of Salvel, the Dukedom of Northruth, and the Kielf Empire, were usually gathered due to war. But on this rare occasion, they were together for the same purpose. Kielf and Salvel had waged war against each other several times in the past. Between these two big countries was Northruth. At present, Kielf's internal affairs are unstable and not in a state that can allow soldiers to be sent out to war against Salvel. This is the reason why the three countries have kept their current peace. However, no one can say when this would continue. It was all up to Kielf Empire. Please excuse me. A young man of grayish hair wearing the military uniform of Kielf entered the room. Letty looked at his shoulder straps and the lines of his sleeves. This young lad was a general. His eyes hold no life, thought Letty when their eyes met for a moment. No emotions were reflected in them. I thank you for the trouble, soldier of Kielf Empire. Shall we start by introducing ourselves? I am August Carlsen Northruth. You may call me Duke Northruth or the Silver Wolf Duke. Letty thought that the latter was harder to say, but decided to keep the comment to herself. I am Salvel's first princess, Letitia Elkreutzer. I have cut my official name for your benefit since it is too long. You are his highnesses. For the first time, the Kielvin soldier showed a hint of emotion when he heard Letty's name. He glanced at Letty and whispered, I see, and continued to introduce himself. I am General Valery Kiryakov. You are the General Kiryakov? The story of the young general being granted the Order of Saint Andre has reached me. How is the fourth prince? Is he doing fine? asked Letty. The right hand of Kielf's fourth prince was none other than Valery Kiryakov. Letty knew about this because his master was once raised as one of her husband candidates. Are you acquainted? inquired the Duke. By name and portrait, yes. 
ah, a prospective marriage partner. But the engagement did not push through because of Kielf's unstable situation. You may become their queen, but could be imprisoned three days after. Duke Northruth frankly pointed out the severe conditions of Kielf's internal affairs, and yet Valerie did not even show any reaction. The sole emotion he had shown throughout their first meeting was his surprise upon hearing Letty's name. Now that we have finished the introductions, shall we proceed now to our main topic, said Letty. And since we are here to have this rare meeting about a wildfire and not of war, can we already come up with a resolution amongst ourselves alone? Or do you need your retainers, taunted Duke Northruth. Letty calmly answered that she did not. Valerie answered the same. Now that they have all agreed, all the other people inside the room went out and left the three representatives of each country. Once the last person out closed the room, they started their meeting. Let me get straight to the point, opened Duke Northruth. Do you have any plans of relinquishing your claim on Mount Gran? Letty and Valerie answered, none. So everyone is still claiming the mountain as their territory. Then let us talk about the current damage first. As of now, North Ruth has taken the most damage due to the heat wave. Wildfires are happening not only on Mount Gran, but also in the surrounding area. We are currently leading the victims of the fire here. How about Salvel? I am yet to receive any report about wildfires happening in Salvel, though we cannot say anything in this situation. We may have nothing now, but tomorrow may be a different story. Last was Kielf, but there is little to no possibility they would be affected by the heat wave. The most damage they could get was on Mount Gran, a territory they were insisting to be theirs. The same for Kielf, there are no reports of wildfires or any casualties due to it. I thought so, sighed Duke Northruth. This was exactly as he had expected. Then moving on. How much are you willing to help about the situation? We are going to need people for the construction of the buffer zone, treatment of the victims and organizing a re-evacuation if needed. All three countries were still laying their claim on Mount Gran. Disagreements on what to do about the fire were inevitable. Kielf Empire shall only perform actions concerning our Mount Gran. As for the victims gathered around the foot of the mountain, should that not be Northrith's responsibility? They are your denizens, after all. This, again, was just as expected. Letty and Duke Northruth knew Kielf was only here to emphasize their claim on the mountain and would not bother giving aid to Northruth. That means you would be joining in the construction of the buffer zone? Of course, it is on our land. But should the army deem the situation to be too dangerous, we will immediately stop and leave, since even if the fire spreads, it will not reach the mainland. I admire your courage in clearly stating your lack of intention to help without any benefits. Kielf was clear on their stance. They would not reach out their hand to help even if there were people suffering in front of them if the people were not of their own. They would prioritize the country's national interest. Salvel? Salvel shall actively take part in the construction of the buffer zone since the fire is happening on our land. We are also willing to extend some help in tending the wounded. They were all prioritizing their own countries. No one was going to back down. Truthfully, Northruth wanted to get help from Kielf and Salvel. Right now, Northruth's army was short on hands. They had to be on alert to put off the fire, treat the sick and wounded, search for missing people, and just in case, lead another evacuation if needed. Kielf would only participate in making of the buffer zone to reinforce their claim on the land, which was not even wholehearted. It was just an act to show that they helped since they are not largely affected by the heat wave. Salvel, on the other hand, was willing to take an active part in the making of the buffer zone because if the fire continued spreading, it could reach Salvel. They were also willing to extend help to the citizens of Northruth, whom they have a deep relationship with and since this meant Northruth would be in their debt. I know it would be like this, but, muttered Letty. They could already see the conclusion to this conference. The three countries would cooperate in making the buffer zone, allotting the same number of people for the job. Salvel, aside from helping in the buffer zone, would also lend a hand to give medical aid to the victims and in searching for the missing people. As for North Ruth, should the fire reach the foot of the mountain, they would help in the evacuation, this includes the citizens of Salvel should they be affected as well. Everyone knew this would be the outcome, but the procedure to reach that was too long and tedious. I have one brilliant suggestion, said Letty. Oh. And that is, asked Duke North Ruth. Letty stood up and walked towards the door. She opened the door by herself and declared to the people waiting outside. We have almost reached to an agreement. Start making the buffer zone immediately. The head commander for this operation shall be Craig Bard. Craig, you hold the highest position now, excluding us. Yes, your highness, accepted Craig. Everyone. Gather at the front. Commanders of each country, report to me how many people you are lending to make the buffer zone. With Craig's call, everyone waiting for their orders moved out. Letty sent them off and when the last person left, she went back inside the room and sat regally on one of the chairs. Oi, cried Duke Northruth. I just reversed the sequence. You were the one who said we had to hurry, were you not, returned Letty. They would reach that said agreement eventually. 
So why not just agree first about it and have everyone move and then the three of them could argue all they want afterwards to polish the agreement. Duke Northruth probably thought of the same thing. His expression did not look like he was against the idea and questioning Letty's actions. Rather, he looked more like disappointed that Letty did it before him. They seem to agree about these kinds of things. We, the ambassadors, are to stay here inside this house and just give instructions. We have all the time we need to hold our meeting. Do you have any problems about that? No, I don't. But I don't remember letting Salvel take over the command. Consider it a matter of seniority. Besides, even if I said Craig was the overall commander, he would only be gathering information and give further instructions to promote efficiency in doing the tasks. He will only be giving the orders to the commander of each country and to his own men. As their men work and turn muddy, the three of them would have to continue their conference even if their throats run dry until they reach on the conclusion. Well then, shall we resume our sessions? asked Letty as she looked at the two men and advised them to take a seat for theirs would be a long discussion. The three-party conference decided to have a recess from their session. Letty used that time and brought Duke with her to check on the victims. Several wildfires happened on Northruth's side of the mountain. They asked help from Duke Northruth and he immediately answered their call. He judged that the northern foot of Mount Grand would be safe so he led them there. However, Mount Grand did not escape the wildfire. The evacuation site was just that, a site for evacuation, a temporary place to rest. Everyone was camping outside since there was no threat of rain pouring down. If this were just the case, then this would have been better. The heat wave is blowing up the ashes from the fire, observed Letty. There were people who could not stop from coughing because of the ashes irritating their throats. Aside from the ashes, the heat wave also brought dust with it and this hurts the eyes of the people. North Ruth is a small country. Their stock of medical supplies was most likely nothing like that of Salvel's. I guess I am the only one who could do something, huh? The only thing Letty could do here was to be careful with her words during the three-party conference so they could not get any commitments from her. She could leave that task to Craig. Astrid's skill as a guard was also first-rate. Yes. She will push through with this decision. There were two things she had to accomplish. First was to deal with the fire and the other was to help the victims. There was a way she could do this at the same time. Duke, I plan to return to the capital on the morrow with one night as an escort. I will bring Astrid with me on the journey and I ask you to stay here. Duke mostly understood what Letty was thinking. First, her intention to return to the capital was to make a decision she cannot possibly make here. Then to return with just one night was because she wanted to have more people available to help here. But he did not understand the part why that night was Astrid. Isn't it the other way around? You bring me with you and leave Astrid here, right? And who do you think is better suited here? You with more strength? Or the frail boy Astrid, asked Letty with a glint in her eyes, and continued on. Putting the joke aside, I have thought much about this. Letty's face was now serious. Both of us are too young and inexperienced. I learned that the hard way in Ilstra. We should gain more experiences now as preparation for the time I ascend the throne. So you're telling me to experience leading an operation for a wildfire? Yes. I have successfully gained my second knight. Your notion for your position would have to change slowly from being a knight for my protection to being the knight of the first seat of the round. I doubt the knights of the round will have to lead a wildfire operation but knowing what goes around the situation and leave the actual operation to the order is completely different from knowing nothing and leaving everything to their care. By having the knowledge, he could easily imagine what was happening just by listening to the reports. Besides, experience is a must for someone who stands on top. You do have some degree of status in the order, but that was it, some degree. So you're saying I'm unreliable? Quite the opposite. If you were just a man of strength, I would have asked you to accompany me to the capital. He was not only strong as a knight. He was capable of taking command as the holder of the first seat of the Knights of the Round. That was the reason why Letty ordered him to stay. Your Highness has a place to gain your experience and I have my own. Yes. You are aware of Astrid's skill, are you not? We will be fine. If someone asked Duke who is the strongest in the order, Astrid's face would be the first one to come to mind. If such a strong knight were to be Letty's guard, then he would give his approval to this scheme, albeit unwillingly. Duke, I will return to the capital and convince everyone to agree in giving help to North Ruth. The opposition will definitely have something to say, but First Princess Letitia is the only one who can make this act of mercy pass through the council. Duke Northruth's honest comment about her voice being nothing but a chirp of a bird about the issue on Mount Grand was indeed true. But her voice held power when it came to providing support. As the kind-hearted Princess Letitia, she could easily have everyone agree to provide support to North Ruth by dispatching doctors and providing free medicines and utilize the order to lead an evacuation in just one meeting. This was because she had always been the one to respond quickly whenever a calamity hit Salvel. She was always there, ready to take command as the representative of the royal family. She will use that experience here. Newbie. 
put in some strength, reprimanded one of Astrid's senior knights as he desperately carried a fallen tree. Astrid was still a boy. It was just like as Letty said. Astrid was not much useful for physical labor. Duke witnessed this and called his junior's name. He brought him somewhere quiet so they could talk alone. Her Highness will be returning to the capital tomorrow. Vice Commander will act in behalf of Her Highness and I will take command of the operation so we have to stay here. Protect Her Highness in our place. I will. There was not much for Duke to do or say as he transferred the guarding duties to Astrid. This young knight was a former mercenary, or maybe even more was Duke's recent thoughts about him. Therefore, compared to Duke who was brought up as rich kid, Astrid was far more knowledgeable about traveling. He did not have to act the senior and remind him to be careful. One last thing. Do you really think you can protect Her Highness alone? If you even feel the a tad bit worried, I'll have another knight from the Order come with you. Yes, I can. I will protect Her Highness with my life, asserted Astrid. He looked straight at Duke, his eyes were serious. Then they would be fine. Duke could safely leave Letty to Astrid's capable hands. If Astrid said he could, then he truly would. That was how reliable his abilities were. With your life, huh? What do you like so much about Her Highness? She's beautiful. Not as a lady, but as a master. I do not understand that distinction at all. For Astrid, he likes Letty, so he wants to protect her. It was that plain and simple for him and could not comprehend Duke's notion of separating Letty as a master and as a woman. Her Highness is like the Polaris for me. Polaris? The Northern Star that doesn't move. Her Highness for me is just like how the Polaris continues on shining to guide lost people. But unlike the Polaris, she is near. She is here and she is a kind-hearted person. Astrid could not understand before why Letty saved his life up to the point of granting him a part of the Night King's power. Why did she give something important like the promise sword like it was the most natural thing to do? Because of her kindness. She was a very kind person, that was why he came to like her. I somehow understand what you're saying. But I think this love of yours to be troublesome. Is it? Well, if you ask me, your feelings seem to be more of adoration rather than love, commented Duke and continued on to whisper to himself, and somehow pure. As the sun set, the three-party conference ended for the day. Letty decided to use the inner room on the second floor to stay for the night. The room only had a bed, a desk, and a chair. But compared to the knights of the order forced to camp outside, this small quarter was almost paradise. Wildfire, buffer zone, murmured Letty. But if it rained? Letty slightly opened the window for a while. She poked a finger out of the opening and imagined the sky high above the ashes blown up by the wind. Call a cool wind from the highest part of the sky. She used the sword of gale winds to call forth the wind and then her window shook violently. I cannot do it. I guess what King Ledger said is true. I may need to practice. She was trying to call a cold wind from high up above the skies, instead, a warm wind entered her room through the slightly opened window. She ended up creating a warm wind close to the earth. I cannot possibly practice here. We already have the heat wave. I cannot aggravate the situation by accidentally calling the wind to the mountains and spread the fire. In the end, the only thing she could do was that of a normal human. And maybe that was how things should be. She was not a god after all, just a mere human. I better get some sleep. I have an early start tomorrow. If she left the window open, ashes could enter the room, so she decided to close it even though it was hot inside the room to sleep. She climbed up the bed and turned off the light. A knock on the door woke her up. Letty immediately stood up, gathered power on her right hand, and called the night sword. Who is it? Valery Kiryakov. May I speak with your highness for a moment? She did not know of any problems they had to discuss about alone. She weighed her options for a moment and decided to listen to his piece as she opened the door. I will turn on the. No need for light, your highness. Please listen to me as you are. If he were not Valerie, she would have not given her permission to talk in the dark. She was a lady, a beautiful lady. She knew she could be seen that way. But this man had nothing reflected in his eyes, aside from a steel resolve found normally in the eyes of someone carrying a heavy burden. He also did not seem to be targeting her life, so she judged he was no danger and let him inside her room. Please excuse me. Is there no one guarding the room? None. We need all the hands we can get for this kind of situation. I do not need one to guard me. Besides, all I have to do is just lock the room and stay inside to be safe. Valerie wished to talk with her alone. He did not even want anyone to know of their conversation. And as if he wanted to finish this quickly and leave, the solval she spoke was quick. Princess Letitia, does your highness know where my master is? Valerie's tone hinted that Letty would know about it. He is in the imperial capital. That is all I know. Though she had heard stories about the fourth prince from the spy she sent to Kielf Empire, she was not certain of their reliability. His highness is under house arrest. He is still safe for now, there are no looming threats for his life, 
but nothing is certain. The Empire is just as His Grace said, Keelf is unstable. It was as the rumors say. Letty and Valerie were talking in total darkness, but she possessed night vision. She could clearly see his expression. He was agitated, his eyes imploring. Your Royal Highness, as Salvel's first princess, started Valerie, but decided to address her in a different manner. As Salvel's crown princess and next sovereign, I have a request. Valerie took a step forward and beseechingly stated his wish. Don't tell me. Letty shivered. She already knew what he wanted. Why did he choose her of all people? Please let His Highness seek asylum in Salvel. This was the only way Valerie knew he could save his master. It was evident from his desperate voice. He took another step as Letty continued her silence and grabbed Letty's shoulder when she tried to step back. Once this issue on Mount Gran has calmed down, I will return to the Imperial capital under the guise of reporting back what happened here. Then I will take His Highness and bring him to the border. Please. I beg you, save him. His dead gray eyes were alive. They reflected his desperation. Letty knew of another who possessed such eyes, eyes of someone who had given up on everything leaving only hopelessness behind. If you will accept His Highness and bring him under Salvel's wing, Valerie took off the sword from his belt and forced Letty to take it as he knelt down on one knee. I, Valerie Kiryakov, Order of Saint Andre, shall swear my loyalty to you as your knight. Stories about Salvel's Knights of the Round have also reached Kielf. He knew about this and offered Letty something she could gain in granting his request. You are still young. I, as Valerie Kiryakov, Order of Saint Andre, will be valuable for you in overpowering your older brothers. Letty scolded herself not to flinch at Valerie's piercing gaze. Are you saying you will switch your allegiance to me despite being this loyal to your present master? I am willing to sell myself to the devil to keep his highness safe. I see. Providing asylum for the fourth prince. Letty was being forced to make this careful decision under Valerie's desperate request. If she made the wrong move, she might start a war in exchange for gaining Valerie Kiryakov as a knight. Salvel's intention may be to provide protection for the prince, but Kielf could easily claim it to be kidnapping and have that as enough grounds to declare a war. There was also another thing she wanted to know. Is this what the prince wanted for himself? I have listened to your wishes. But I cannot answer immediately. Let us talk about this again after the problem about the fire has been resolved. Letty never drew the sword given to her and returned it to Valerie. Will that be amenable? Yes, your highness. Valerie stood, took the sword back, and bowed his head once. He was about to open the door when he stopped and looked back at Letty. Princess Letitia, do you believe in God? In miracles? Letty opted to answer vaguely to his religiously bent question. The first king of Salvel was believed to be a child of God. Therefore, the royal family descended from God. That's one interpretation for it. As for miracles, I think the concept is subjective. For example, if rain poured down as of this moment, everyone would consider it a miracle. Rain itself was nothing miraculous. What makes it miraculous was the present situation that was in dire need of it. Letty evaded the question by saying it depends on people, then Valerie smiled. Then your highness does not believe in God? Perhaps. I believe that is fine. You are right. There is no God. There are no miracles either. Because if there was, I should have died before I was even granted the Order of Saint Andre. With that, Valerie left the room. Letty locked the door from the inside and sighed quietly. Better to consider the question about God and miracles insignificant. The important thing to think about before he said that nonsense was his request to provide protection for the fourth prince. This is what it means to carry a nation, thought Letty as she remembered Valerie's words. He depended on her as the next queen. From now on, she would be forced to make her decisions as the queen and not as the kind-hearted princess. My hands are already full with this issue on the wildfire and now this. I feel my head will burst. But right now was not the time to think about the fourth prince. The fire on Mount Gran was the priority. She needs to push through the agreement about providing aid in order to help and save as many people as possible. And for that, Letty needed sleep, so she laid on the bed and closed her eyes. But sleep would not come to Letty, so she decided to go out and have some fresh air. She was certain if someone found her sneaking out, they would insist on her taking a guard with her so she stealthily went out of her room. She successfully got outside of the house without anyone seeing her. The moment she stepped outside, a hot wind attacked her person and a voice questioning her. Princess? Letty was surprised by the voice that called her from behind. She quickly turned around to see the owner of the voice. Duke Northruth? What are you doing out here at this time? I should be the one asking you that. Take a guard with you if you are going to walk outside this late at night. And as was expected, she was scolded with the same words she had thought of a while ago. She understood that many worried about her since they all thought she was a delicate princess and did not know about the power of the Night King inside her body. So to keep matters simple, she would just agree and say she would do so next time, which she still probably would not. 
I understand the feeling of not being able to sleep, said Duke Northruth. But if you stay out here for long, the ashes and dust may harm your lungs and eyes. Yes, I am aware of that. The evacuees are also suffering because of this wind. The ashes were not the only concern. Duke Northruth originally judged this place was safe, but the wildfire was threatening the area now as well. They would need to be prepared in case they have to move out to a different location. I have been wondering about this since the afternoon. I find that there are many people here. It is quite a number. How severe was the fire? Letty had only heard Duke Northruth discuss about the victims that were staying at the foot of Mount Gran once, but he never discussed the whole scope of the damage brought by the fire to his dukedom. Belden got burnt. Letty was speechless at Duke Northruth's constricted voice. Belden? Why did you not say such an important thing? The Belden region was the main food source of Northruth. It was blessed to have a clear stream and fertile lands. With such an important region burnt, how could Northruth even survive the coming winter? Mount Gran is the top priority for now. All the more so with Belden gone. If they cannot self-sustain their food supply, they would have to buy it from the neighboring countries. For these goods to be delivered, the roads should be passable. The southern road connects Northruth to Ilstra, while the northern road connects to Kielf. Mount Gran is facing these roads. If the fire reaches down the foot, it would close off the two roads connecting North Ruth, therefore cutting off her lifeline. What do you plan to do for winter? I will find a way. That is my job as the Duke. If North Ruth used the funds amassed from their prosperous trade, they could probably buy enough supplies to last the winter. But that is if the other countries will have something to sell to them. The damage of the heat wave is severe. North Ruth is most likely not the only experiencing problems with their produce. Finding a way for this was indeed a difficult predicament. I will be returning to Salvel tomorrow morning. You may expect us to dispatch the order and some doctors to provide medicine and tents as well. But that was all. It was only enough to help the present victims. It was not big enough to support North Ruth through the winter. I am thankful just to accept that much. The heat wave has not reached Salvel. They have enough resources to help North Ruth. But to use those resources to help a foreign country is out of the question. Duke Northruth understood Letty's hesitation and told her not to worry about it. Prioritizing your own is the correct decision, Princess. We both carry the weight of our nations. I understand that as well, said Duke Northruth. We should get some sleep. Let me escort you back to your room. Letty was ashamed of herself who could not say anything. Part 2 Letty unknowingly found herself in the Night King's study. Only Administrative King Karl Heinz was present. Good evening, Queen Letitia. Good evening. Duke Northruth's words would not leave Letty's ears. She was not sure what to do. Or rather, she already knew what she wanted to do, but it was a stupid thing to do. The question was whether to provide full support for North Ruth or not. Lion King Alexander would probably tell her to use this opportunity to attack. One-armed King Oswald would most likely refuse to help, saying that they did not have that much of an allowance to provide help. Gunshot King Ledger would probably advise her not to freely provide aid if it would benefit the country. Then how about the wise ruler, Administrative King Karl Heinz? May I ask you a question, started Letty? What if there was a neighboring country that was suffering and you had the power to help them? What would you do as the king? That is quite a vague explanation of the situation, Queen Letitia. Letty could only look downward at Karl Heinz's indefinite reply. Then let me ask you something more specific. What is troubling you? The amount of support to give was Letty's problem. North Ruth was originally part of Salvel. Extending some help was easy. But with Belden burnt down, some help would not be enough. A lot of people in a neighboring country are suffering. They may not be able to survive the coming winter and deaths are most likely to happen. I want to help them. Salvel, at present, has more than enough resources to do so. But, whether doing so will benefit us, I do not know. North Ruth is the buffer nation between Salvel and Kielf. They would not lose anything if they provided help to North Ruth. If anything, it may boost the allegiance of North Ruth to Salvel. Aside from that, the roads connecting Ilstra and Kielf were also important. Lending a hand to rebuild quickly these roads would be for Salvel and as preparation if anything worse happened. But all of these sound like excuses. She wanted to change the sum help to a big-scale assistance. She was hesitating on that part. I think I am preparing reasons for helping them because I just want to help. And I know that as the monarch, I cannot do politics with emotions alone. She could no longer be the kind-hearted princess. She had to make her judgments as the queen of her country. Letty scolded herself for being such a child. I see. However, I do not understand the need to classify them as purpose and reason. Karl Heinz answered as his gentle eyes looked at Letty. Purpose and reason? Yes, can they not be both your purpose? For Letty, her purpose was to help the people and the reason for that was it would be for Salvel's benefit. But Karl Heinz did not agree. 
There are people suffering so you want to save them. That is good, so go, and help them. Extending help would be a plus for Salvel, then that is even better. Go and help them. Karl Heinz taught Letty that those two were not a purpose and a reason. They were both her purpose. Queen Letitia, the weight of having two purposes compared to one is completely different, therefore, as the ruler, you should not falter. That is a convenient way of saying things. But I do not think my retainers will agree. Your retainers would not agree? Letitia, never forget. We are kings. Letty remembered she was told the same thing before. Understanding your retainers is good, but we should never be retainers ourselves. If you end up being like them who could see only where you stand and only say things that would be of the benefit of the country, then you are no longer a monarch. When Letty was told of this before, she said then that a wise ruler's words were difficult to comprehend. But now, she could understand the meaning behind those words. We, as monarchs, stand at the highest point. Therefore, we see further than anyone else. It may be meaningless for your time now, but it would definitely mean something for the next rulers. Who would say those things if we do not? The heat waves from Ilstra go down Mount Gran every few decades. Having a budget allotted for such a situation will be best. The heat waves did not go over the mountains during Karl Heinz's time when he had the budget for it established. But it came down to the next king. Thanks to his foresight, Salvel was prepared and was able to recover quickly from the crisis. Karl Heinz's policy was later one praised by the future people. Once you have decided on something, you should never falter from it. Continue on showing them that this is correct. That is the role of the ruler. Great grandfather. She was given great encouragement to do what she wanted. She tightly clenched her first. Her eyes and her heart were burning with resolution. This was how things should be done. Raise your head up high and do what you must. Remember, we are kings. Yes, I will no longer hesitate. I will accomplish giving them assistance until the end. Letty prepared herself to get the large-scale assistance approved in order to fulfill her purposes. Part 3 The next morning, Letty went to Duke Northruth to say her goodbye before she left for Salvel. The Letty that stood in front of Duke Northruth this morning was not the same Letty last night who showed hesitation. This Letty now was filled with resolve. Back in Ilstra, you said that my voice was just like the chirping of a little bird, did you not? What? Are you holding a grudge because of it? I thought of making you change your opinion. My voice is powerful when it comes to providing aid and support. I suggest we have an agreement now, right here and just between us. Last time, when Duke Northruth made the same proposal for Mount Gran, Letty lost her footing in their negotiation. However, for this case about giving support to Northruth, Letty had the power to push forth a decision. And what agreement will it be? The Kingdom of Salvel will provide large-scale support to the Dukedom of Northruth. Duke Northruth was stunned upon hearing the words large-scale. We shall provide you with enough support to help you survive the coming winter. We will give you food and temporary shelter for the victims who have lost their homes until to help you recover from the crisis. Duke Northruth fervently prayed for this. He was at a loss for words at Letty's offer. It was a miracle. Be grateful for this kindness, smiled Letty. Duke Northruth finally found his voice. Can you really make that happen? Yes. I promise. I will make sure of it and return here with the good news. They were both rulers of a nation who carried the weight of their countries. One look in their eyes and they would know the other was serious. Letty's eyes told Duke Northruth that she would not betray him. The overjoyed Duke could not help himself and hugged Letty. Duke Northruth cried Letty in surprise. I am grateful for this. Be careful. I know you have a lot of enemies inside your own country. Letty was flustered. She knew he was only showing his gratitude and nothing more, but their proximity was disturbing her. Duke Northruth, on the other hand, wondered at her reaction as he cocked his head on one side. Oh, right, realized Duke Northruth. You were a lady. He seemed to have forgotten about this fact and this was proof that he was truly looking at her regardless of her gender. He truly did not have any other intention from this action. Indeed, he did not. Letty understood that but she could not suppress her instinctive reaction to it, the deadly self-defense move Friedhelm taught her. She clenched her first and made Duke Northruth feel the pain of Letty's signature move, a punch to the stomach and a slap on the face as the enemy leans forward in pain. Duke Northruth fainted due to the shock and the pain. Chapter 2 The Meeting at Noon Letty and Astrid arrived at the capital at midnight after four days of traveling from Mount Gran. Letty thanked Astrid for escorting her throughout the journey until the royal villa. She was welcomed home by the servants waiting for her at the door. Upon entry, she found her younger brother who had not slept a wink waiting for her. Beside him stood an unexpected person. Welcome home Ain Yue, greeted Leon Hart. This one over here just had some business with me. There's no need to greet him, he was on his way anyway. I am sorry for intruding, apologized Guido. That you are, agreed the younger prince and then he noticed Letty's uncharacteristic movement. 
ain't you e? Letty took a glance at her half-brother, second Prince Guido, then to her brother Leonhardt and briskly went inside the villa. She did not even spare her brothers a second glance as she shouted, I do not want to talk to you looking like this. Wait here until I have freshened up. Guido was undoubtedly Salvel's most handsome man. Letty's womanly pride would not allow her to stand up next to him looking all travel-worn. Definitely not. Anue seems like has something to discuss with you. Most likely about the fire on Mount Gran. I have received a simple report about it. I see. We need to have the other one then. How should we call him? We cannot be seen all gathered up together in the middle of the night now, can we? It will be a big problem for all of us. Leonhardt was right. The royal siblings fighting over the crown were supposed to be on bad terms with each other and could not simply call and visit each other this late at night. How about telling him you caught a fever so he should come and visit you? Sometimes, I cannot help but think you're stupid, Guido Aniue. Do you think that would be believable for someone who has never paid me a visit when I was sick? That's why I hate you, resented Leonhardt as he caught a maid and asked her to deliver a message. Now, all that was left was to wait for Letty. Letty hurriedly washed her hair and body with a hot bath to clean off the dirt and dust of travel. Once all of that was done, she asked a maid to call Guido and Leonhardt. Her hair was still damp and the dress she wore was a simple one meant for indoors. She decided this was enough since they were just family after all. Take a seat. You might have known about this already, but there had been fires on Mount Gran. Only Guido took a seat while Leonhardt leaned against the windowsill. Was it terrible? I would like to see a wildfire that was not terrible. Great-grandfather's foresight is commendable, is it not? The heat wave from Ilstra goes over the mountains once every few years. Administrative King Karl Heinz proposed to have a budget allotted for such an incident since it was bound to happen in the future. This proposal was enacted and still continues to be in effect now. If there happens to be a wildfire, Salvel has the means to immediately address whatever casualties the fire may bring. But this foresight is for Salvel. To use it for Northrith's support is, started Guido when Leon Hart butted in. Our little troop is now complete, ain't you e? Letty looked at the window from where Leon Hart stood and she was shocked by the human figure emerging from the dark. Prince Friedhelm. Coming. I'll open the lock now, said Leon Hart. Once Leon Hart opened the window, their other half-older brother rushed inside. You do have some guts to tell me to sneak in through the window, huh, Leon Hart? Well, the three of you are supposed to be on bad terms. There was no other way. Guido and Iue happened to be here already because of some business with me, so you had to be the one to come here stealthily. Getting away from Seventh Heaven's watch was a pain, you know. Add to that I have to come here like I'm a secret lover of some married woman. At least let the room be that of a voluptuous countess or something. I somehow understand why you are friends with Duke Northruth. I had the same thought about him, how the two of you are raised to be well-mannered gentlemen, but your speech is uncouth. Can you not try to refine it, commented Letty? Such a manner of speaking was embarrassing to be heard from a Prince of Salvel. Even Astrid's speech had more finesse. I eagerly learned this speech during my academy days. And even if you don't welcome it, just being there is enough to influence you. I act as the proper prince in front of everybody else, so just let me be when I'm with my family. But Prince Guido attended the same academy and had retained his finesse. Well, Guido never really paid attention to his surroundings. His classmates were also careful not to use such language when speaking to him, explained Friedhelm. You know, you've got to learn some from me. I see. I make my friends self-conscious when they speak to me, contemplated Guido. You do not have to take that seriously. You are a prince. Making them self-conscious is just right. Letty glared at Friedhelm, telling him with her sharp gaze to stop picking at Guido since he does not understand jokes. But this was not what I wanted to talk about. Their conversation had gone away with the real topic, so Letty coughed once to call everyone into order. Now, going back. I am sure you have already heard about the incident on Mount Gran. As of now, there are no victims yet from Salvel, but we cannot say for certain until the heat waves stop. Then North Ruth is the one who suffered the blow? Yes. I heard Belden was burnt down. Wildfires were not limited to the area around Mount Gran, but also within their territory. We cannot joke about their situation then now that Belden is gone. Belden was known to be Northrith's food source. Letty needed not to elaborate on this since Friedhelm immediately understood the complications that comes with it, Northruth cannot survive the winter. Duke Northruth had already evacuated all the victims from Belden to the northern foot of Mount Gran. Right now, a buffer zone is being constructed to prevent another fire from spreading down to Northruth. Salvel and Kielf are helping in the construction. Mount Gran, for both countries, is their own after all. Mount Gran was under territorial claims between the three countries, but it was thanks to this issue that they were cooperating now to keep the wildfire on the mountain under control. In tomorrow's meeting, I will be proposing large-scale aid for Northruth. Large-scale here means I want to use our heatwave emergency funds to help them survive winter. 
you'll meet a lot of opposition if you want to do that much, replied Friedhelm. And the kind-hearted princess will win against all of it. What I want to ask of you is to show no opposition about my proposal. You do not even need to show support. Just join the meeting and be quiet. Not having the two princes go against her would be a big help for her already. If she only had the time, she would also ask help from others in advance to prepare the stage for tomorrow's meeting. Unfortunately, she did not have that luxury. Of course, you'd be giving us something in return. Friedhelm would not just agree to this scheme for free. Leonhardt glared at him, silently telling him to die. I will agree to meet some of your proposed husband candidates, personally. Prepare two from each of you. Letty had all refused the candidates they sent to her. To have her meet them now was one big hurdle overcome for Friedhelm. Besides, Letty had always acted as the gentle and sweet princess in front of everyone, she could not act cold and distant when she faced the candidates. This was too good of a chance for Friedhelm to pass up. Well, 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 then I shall have a man who'd say as you wish to your every command. I accept this condition as well, agreed Guido. She had covered everything needed to be discussed. She was about to send them home when she remembered something. One more thing, started Letty. She was about to mention Valerie's request to grant protection for the fourth prince of Kielf, but decided not to tell them. Asking them now about this when I do not have an answer on my own would not be a consultation. It would mean I do not have confidence in my own opinion. I need to have an answer first and then I would consult with them. She is a monarch. She cannot leave everything to be someone else's responsibility. I made a lover in Ilstra. He is currently busy so I cannot introduce him to you yet, but I will eventually. So could you select a husband candidate that can tolerate him, joked Letty to cover up what she meant to say. Ilstra? Lover? Don't tell me it's that rake Victor? He's more than twenty and yet only has women in his mind, protested Friedhelm. Or is it the other stupid man August? Whoever it is, I am against both. I'm strongly against the two of them. Friedhelm knew that Victor, Ilster's first prince, liked Letty. He was also aware of Duke Northworth's preference for intelligent and beautiful women. He was starting to curse God for what happened. Letty was just supposed to attend her cousin's wedding. Why did this have to happen? Friedhelm on EUE, could you try using your head a little? She said a lover and not a fiancé. This means there is a difference between their social status. Those two are both men of status qualified to be her husband, explained Leonhardt as he laughed coldly. Then a noble of Ilstra or one of the knights of the order. Only Guido was the one seriously thinking who the man could be. Duke. What are you doing, man? That's what you're a knight for. It could be him, you know, insinuated Leonhardt. The difference in social status? Ah, I see, murmured Guido. Shall we break his neck when he returns? Leonhardt agreed to Guido's suggestion. That was a good joke. Sharp-tongued jokes are one of Salvel's royal family's special skills, after all. No, I was serious. Eh? You were serious? Letty looked at her brothers and somehow reflected on her own joke. Perhaps it was a bit too much for them. In truth, she had gained a knight and not a lover, but to tell them the truth now was somehow troublesome. She just decided to end their conversation and forced them out of her room. Once her brothers left, she sat down in front of her desk. She had a lot of things to accomplish tonight. I truly have to consider the husband issue soon. But for now, providing aid to Northruth comes first. This sudden happening left her without any cards prepared in her hand so she had to sacrifice herself in exchange for her brother's cooperation. Now, the rest was up to her efforts. Oh right, I have to open the window. She opened the latch of the window and held out her hand. This night at Salvel's capital was still. It was the perfect weather for the practice she started since she left Mount Gran. Letty closed her eyes and felt the wind. Letty slept not a wink last night to finish making the document needed for the morning's meeting. After completing everything, she brought Astrid with her as she headed towards her battlefield, the conference room. Her task now was not to lead the operations at Mount Gran, nor was it to care for the wounded and pray for everyone's safety. She had to gain the council's agreement for the large-scale aid for North Ruth. I have here my report about the wildfire at Mount Gran. Letty stood up and looked at the members in attendance of the meeting. On the 5th of this month, Northrith's soldiers confirmed the presence of heat waves around Mount Gran. This continued for three days, resulting in the first wildfire on the 8th. The fire stopped naturally after half a day, but another fire happened on the 10th, presented Letty. She took the trouble to lay down first the facts most likely known by all the members before she proceeded to her real agenda. The fires did not happen on Mount Gran alone. Several fires were also reported to be burning the mountain range facing North Ruth and Ilstra. The victims who have lost their homes evacuated to the northern foot of Mount Gran as their temporary shelter as instructed by Duke North Ruth. Duke North Ruth selected the northern foot of Mount Gran because it was close to the station, making transportation easier. He also thought it was safe from the heatwave. But the heatwave this year was strong and went over Mount Gran. 
His plan of evacuation was sound at the time of planning, but it could turn out to be a bad decision with the present situation. Many are suffering right now at Mount Gran. Their lungs are burnt by the heat wave and the ashes and dust continually hurt their eyes and throat. They are all asking for help, but Northrith's military forces already have their hands full with the search and rescue operations. They can no longer extend help to the other victims. Such a situation could easily warrant an agreement to provide some aid to Northruth. But that was not all Letty had to say. The Belden region of the dukedom of Northruth was burnt. If this situation persists, then they cannot survive the coming winter. Even if they could buy food from other countries, this would still depend on if they have enough surplus to sell to them. This heat wave did not affect Northruth alone. It was most likely the produce of the other neighboring countries was affected by this as well. This poor yield could lead to higher prices too. Now that all the facts had been laid, it was time for the battle. Letty, standing right inside the battlefield, made her declaration of war. I propose for the Kingdom of Salvel to send out a large-scale aid to the Dukedom of Northruth, announced Letty in her clear and confident voice. The room turned silent for a moment. A question from one of the members broke it. How much is large-scale? We have a heat wave emergency fund. I propose to use 30% of our fund that has accumulated for the past 10 years in order to dispatch a medical team and supply them with food and medicines for free in addition to the assistance for the search and rescue operation to be provided by the Royal Chivalric Order. Letty had always been a proponent of providing help and support to people, but this was the largest she had ever proposed. Helping North Ruth to a certain extent is understandable, but the scale this time is too big. 30% is too much. Opposition from the members not under the neutral faction were starting to be raised. But Letty was prepared for them. She did not say 30% without any thought behind it. We are fortunate that ever since this fund was established, the heat wave had only affected Salvel once. Therefore, even if we use 30% of the 10-year budget, we would still have more than enough even if the heat wave continues until the following year or even the year after that. Salvel would still have an enough budget to sustain herself even after providing an all-out support to North Ruth. But the enemies, the families of the three Grand Marquises, would not be silenced. A member of the Yulenberg questioned Letty. Let us just say there will be enough left for Salvel. But what benefit are we to get from doing this charity? The budget is for Salvel's good, after all. Then he murmured, this is why princesses are just trouble. And they have started the fight. One day, you'll find yourself crying, Yulenberg's dog, swore Letty as she took a deep breath to prepare herself to attack. She exhaled and then started her piece. This will be for Salvel's benefit. Letty was prepared to shut down these noisy men. She is the sister of the bluff expert Friedhelm and the master debater Guido. The possibility of North Ruth returning this favor is not to be considered a benefit, your highness, snickered another. Her leftover princess moniker could be heard around the room, but Letty ignored them and continued resolute in her stand. North Ruth and the Keelf Empire are helping in putting out the fire at Mount Gran, at our Mount Gran. They are offering their help out of goodwill. Should we not also repay them with goodwill? Mount Gran for Salvel was her own land. Therefore, what the other two countries are doing for Mount Gran should not be interpreted as a claim on the land but an act of kindness on their part. Letty clarified this point to them. That may be true, and therefore our act of goodwill should be of an equal value. But your highness's proposal is too much to be considered as an act of goodwill. If this happened to any another country, then I agree that repaying them with an equal value is enough. But we are talking about North Ruth. North Ruth is a country of her own now, but in the past, she used to be a part of Salvel and everyone is aware of that history. We share the same race and language as North Ruth, we are like sisters, a family. So if Salvel abandoned them in this time of crisis, it is like telling them we are nothing but strangers. Such treatment would make North Ruth feel like we betrayed them and that feeling of resentment and disappointment will surely be cause for trouble in the future. And that future was not far. I presume you are all aware of the unstable situation in the Kielf Empire, are you not? They are on the verge of having a civil war and this is the main reason why North Ruth, the buffer state, is valuable to us. The moment the Kielf Empire was mentioned, an eerie tension invaded the room. Letty took note of the change and felt satisfied at the effect of her words. Yes, they should fear the Kielf Empire, the great empire of the North that had waged war against Salvel several times. As we are hesitating to help North Ruth, Kielf may already be reaching out to them. When that happens, North Ruth may change her allegiance as a buffer state for Salvel to be a buffer state for Kielf. North Ruth might select the Northern Empire over us. Everyone at the meeting looked at Letty. Their eyes were no longer lackadaisical as if they were just listening to a princess's whims. They were turning serious as they truly start thinking about Salvel's future. Please consider again your agreement to provide aid for North Ruth in exchange for Salvel's peaceful future. Letty once again stated her proposal. The reaction to it was completely different to the reaction she had received the first time she presented it. Astrid was patiently waiting for Letty in the corridor. He tried listening to the voices that could be heard from outside. 
He did not have knowledge about the proceedings for a meeting, but he was sure this meeting was no longer fit to be called a morning meeting. It was already noon when the council had reached a decision and people started to leave the room. Among them was one person who knew Astrid and greeted him. Good job waiting. Letitia will be out in a bit. She is still finalizing some things about the support party to send to Northruth with His Majesty and Commander Johannes. That person was Prince Friedhelm. What's with that face? asked the prince. Well, I was just surprised. Your Highness was there in the meeting. Why you? Who do you think I am? In case you don't know, I am the first Prince of Salvel, Prince Friedhelm. I was surprised because I have not heard Your Highness's voice even once during the meeting. Astrid, who knew nothing about what happened inside, answered straightforwardly that it was quite refreshing for the prince. Astrid's answer could have been interpreted as a sarcastic comment that Friedhelm only attended the meeting and did not contribute anything to the discussion. But Friedhelm knew that this young knight was not capable of such subterfuge so he just agreed that he truly did not say a word. There was some opposition about giving the support then, murmured Astrid and then boldly asked, do we not have the money to do so? For Astrid, the only reason why there would be any difficulties in extending help was because they do not have the financial capacity to do so. They cannot, so they would not. My great-grandfather, the administrative king Karl Heinz, had left a dictum to allot a budget every year as an emergency fund in case the heat wave hit Salvel since such a case would surely happen once every few years. Thanks to that, Salvel always has the funds ready and could be used immediately when the need arises. But the decision to provide the support was not agreed upon immediately. Because it was not for us. Twas natural for them to be a bit stingy in providing that much assistance, even for North Ruth. Doing something for the benefit of your own country is the correct way of doing politics. There are people suffering right in front of you. You are capable of helping them, but still do not. That is politics. I see, replied Astrid. He realized he was not one for politics because he could not understand how it worked. However, on the north of Salvel was the currently unstable Kielf Empire. We do not know when they would suddenly send their soldiers down to us so North Ruth as the buffer state was important. If the need arises, we could use it as a battlefield. Therefore, helping North Ruth now did not seem such a bad idea after all. So in the end, after a lot of considerations, helping North Ruth would be for Salvel's benefit? Yes. Then why not just help from the start, thought Astrid. Politics is hard. North Ruth should be grateful to our first princess. If she was not the one who proposed this and presented the arguments, the most they could get from Salvel would be cheaper prices for the goods. Your Highness cannot do it? You know, you should just voice out your admiration for Letitia without throwing a barb at me, commented Friedhelm before answering the question. No, I cannot. This had to be done by Letitia. If Guido or I did this, they would just think we were doing it to gain points. Astrid wanted to ask what the points were for, but decided to just continue listening. If they think that our proposition to help was just a plot to get some points, the opposing faction would definitely do everything to pull it down. But such a thought would not even cross their mind for Letitia. She also had her past good deeds to support her. Letty, since before, had always been active in supporting the promotion of education and welfare. This was not her first time providing help for a wildfire. She knows what to do to put together a support party. She also had the most experience of going to sites of crises as the representative of the royal family. She did not have an active role in politics or the military, but she was a constant presence in charity works. That was the image of the first princess of Salvel Letty had created. She was not only adored by the nobles, but also by the citizens of Salvel. Our kind-hearted princess wants to help. If doing so will be a benefit to us, then we should, regardless of if it was large-scale. She had laid the groundwork for so many years that more than respect, I shudder at how perfectly things are going for her. Since when had she been preparing for this? Could things really go this smoothly without her being aware of what she was doing? Friedhelm sometimes have these questions about Letty. Amazing, blurted Astrid as he blushed. He was inspired. Friedhelm immediately understood Astrid's thoughts had gone in a different direction, so he asked, what's amazing? Well, it meant that Her Highness had been continuously putting in her efforts so that she could always help people. I see it went that way, murmured Friedhelm. Yes, you're right. I know that in the end, she is just a kind-hearted person under all of it. And that kind-heartedness was influencing everything to go too smoothly. In other words, she seems to be dearly beloved by some fate. Friedhelm groaned inwardly with envy. For this case, there are many people suffering and she has the power to help them, so she wants to lend them a hand. She totally thought this is what a human ought to do. A human? Astrid's thoughts stopped there. He was very familiar with a similar phrase, what a knight ought to do. This phrase was commonly found in his textbook on morals and ethics at the Knight Academy. A knight ought to save people. A knight ought to be kind towards women and children. I see. Her Highness is helping not because she is a princess, but because she is human. Astrid thought this was an important thing he should remember. Astrid. 
I have finished everything as scheduled, called Letty in her clear voice ending his conversation with Prince Friedhelm. You are to come with me later as my guard for my trip back to Mount Gran. I know you are tired, but you will accept the task, will you not? Yes, your highness. Letty was satisfied with Astrid's happy reply and proceeded to the next person she had to talk with, Friedhelm whom Astrid was just talking to a while ago, and Guido who was watching the pair from a distance. Prince Friedhelm, how is the draft of the support unit from the order? Here you go, princess. It already has the commander's signature right there on the approval line. Letty took a look at the document and it was really signed by Johannes. Prince Guido, how about the approval to use the budget and the list of supplies? The budget is already signed by the Prime Minister. As for the list. I have already checked it, explained Guido as he gave Letty the documents. Letty looked at it and they were just as he had said. She asked them these things last night and they also attended this morning's meeting. For them to have all of these prepared meant they had also stayed up all night just like her. I appreciate all this help. To thank you, why not send one of your knights with me to Mount Gran? That would show you helped out in giving the aid to North Ruth and that fact would be my repayment so I will not owe you anything. For Letty, taking all of the credits for this would not be good for her in the future. To prevent future troubles, she had to show consideration to the Lauenstein and Yulenberg factions. Then let me send Oscar from Seventh Heaven. He is a former doctor, so he should be useful. Then Bruno will be the one from Valkyrie. His hometown is near Mount Gran and had been worried since he heard of the fire. I am sure he will take initiative even if you don't give him any orders. Negotiations were successfully made and Letty curtsied after thanking them. She turned on her heel and started walking out. Astrid was about to go after her when Friedhelm grabbed him the back of his collar. Hey, what are you planning to do from here on? asked Friedhelm in a hushed voice so that Letty could not hear. I will go to Mount Gran as Her Highness's guard. I meant about your future. Better take this kind advice from me. Letitia will be crowned as the queen in a few years so you'd better move quickly to take up a place in the remaining eleven seats of her Knights of the Round. Friedhelm's advice was spot on. There were even fewer seats now that the vice commander had filled up the second seat. Thank you, said Astrid as he ran after Letty. He heard Friedhelm say from afar that being young was so nice. The preparations for the departure of the first support party was completed earlier than Letty had expected. Commander Johannes had already given instructions to the knights to pack after Friedhelm showed him the proposal. The Prime Minister also did the same, he already gave instructions even before her proposal was approved. And all of these happened even before the morning meeting when her brothers asked for their signatures. Truly having reliable people around was something to be grateful for. All that was left was the doctor she requested Leonhardt to handle. But that was already taken care of. Leonhardt went to commission two elder doctors while she was busy with the meeting. When the two doctors heard Letty's request, the gladly accepted it. I am sorry, but please expect you would not be able to return for a while. The elderly doctors laughed at Letty's words. We had served as doctors during the war. Camping out may just bring back our young spirits. Indeed. We can still hold ourselves against the white doctors. Any doctor would know about them. The white doctors were a group of doctors who went around battlefields carrying white flags and treated the wounded regardless if they were soldiers or civilians, hence the name. Letty of course knew about them as well. A former member of the said group will be coming with us this time to Mount Gran. To have a young doctor with stamina for this kind of situation is valuable, thought Letty as she looked at the former doctor who was talking with Friedhelm. Oscar Schleiden was a knight in Friedhelm's personal order, Seventh Heaven. Several anecdotes about him were going around like he was invited by the emperor from the east to be his personal attending physician or that he had been awarded with a special order from a country in the south. The reason why he left the white doctors, however, is a mystery. He could have been taken in by Friedhelm's charm, or he had some other reason. Letty, like all others, could only speculate. Should your highness really personally go to Northruth? asked one of the doctors. The question brought Letty back out of her rumination and answered, yes, I am the person in charge both for this relief operation and for the territorial dispute about Mount Gran. Besides, being there to personally see the situation is more efficient than waiting here in the capital for the reports sent by Express. What assuring words from our princess. Then at least change seats with me, your highness. Seats meant their seating arrangement in the carriage. This party was the first to be dispatched, so not much could be prepared at a moment's notice. They loaded the carriage with as much supplies as could fit inside, creating a space for the two doctors to sit at the roof rack was all they could manage. Letty was left to ride beside the coachman. No, the present arrangement is fine. My job is to safely deliver the supplies to Mount Gran. After that, all I have to do is to listen and nod at the reports. Your job will be after we reach Mount Gran. It is better for you to save your energies until then. Letty shortly bid farewell to the people who had come to send them off and soon the first support party was on their way. The party was able to reach the next big town via the main road before sunset as scheduled. They rented a small inn and everyone retired early to prepare for the early start on the morrow. 
I hope nothing untoward happens and we reach North Ruth safely, prayed Letty as she sat on her bed and stared at the lamp's light. Their first day went according to plan. They were also blessed with good weather. If their good fortune continues, they could reach Mount Gran in five days. A knock on the window broke her reverie. She stood up to check when she heard a familiar voice call out, Your Highness. You really prefer entering through windows, commented Letty as she opened the window to let Astrid in. I slipped out of the room so I cannot enter from the front door. He had to report something in secret. Letty pointed out a corner of the room not visible from outside. Astrid silently moved to the location Letty pointed and started reporting first about the situation outside. The wind outside suddenly became strong. This has been happening recently and your highness is the reason behind these strong winds, is it not your highness? Letty had granted Astrid one of the promised swords, the Sword of White Light, to save his life. Thus, Astrid knows everything about the Night King and this could have been the reason how he sensed that the strong winds every night was of Letty's doing. Is your highness all right to use your power that much? I am careful not to overexert myself. I am only trying to acclimate myself with using and controlling large amounts of energy. I see, if you say so, reluctantly agreed Astrid. He was not sure whether to believe her or not. Is that all? Ah, I have a report. I observed some suspicious movements from Mr. Oscar. After he confirmed the schedule for tomorrow, he left a note on one of the trees outside the inn. Oscar? What did it contain? Today's date and probably an established code between them. Letty nodded at Astrid's report. The note most likely said on schedule since it was just their first day of travel. Should I tie him up and leave him here? asked Astrid. Letty considered the situation. Detaining Oscar here would be an easy task for Astrid, however, his motives were not yet clear. Is it Letty's life? Or is to prevent the delivery of supplies? It could also be something personal. Let him be for now. Besides, I would like to be certain on who the mastermind is. Your Highness is not surprised about this? The possibility of Lauenstein and Yulenberg interfering with me had been there since the start. There was a half of a possibility for that to happen, and the scales tipped to the bad. Friedhelm and Guido supposedly selected the knights to come with her with utmost care. Oscar, whom Friedhelm chose, was a former doctor and does not have any debt or connection to the Lauenstein. Bruno, from Guido's Valkyrie, was possessor of an honest personality, almost to a fault. He would rather die than choose to help in the murder of a woman or a child. Is Mr. Oscar indebted to the Lauenstein? asked Astrid. He was mostly ignorant about Salvel's noble families so he probably did not know the relationship between Friedhelm and Oscar. Oscar Schleiden is not connected to Lauenstein in any way. Strictly speaking, he may not even be connected to Salvel. He was a former white doctor. Have you heard of them? I have, in one of my classes. If I remember correctly, no one is allowed to attack a white doctor that is raising a white flag in the battlefield. Yes. This was not particularly decided in any law or treaty, but it is acknowledged by all. I cannot even fathom how much suffering he had witnessed during his time as a white doctor and the effort he had exerted to help save lives until he found his way to Salvel. These white doctors spend every day with death hovering on battlefields, tending the wounded and sending off patients who could not make it. Their emotional strength and focus might even be stronger than any elite force a big country possesses. Letty was admiring the works of the white doctors in her head, when Astrid brought her back to reality with a practical question. Ever since I've heard about them, I have been wondering how they survive since they are treating patients for free. They were a group, so if they do not receive payment, then where do they get their food and medicines? That is like asking how an artist lives. There are always those wealthy benefactors who like sponsoring people who do things for free. Meaning there is someone supporting the white doctors? Yes. Who could they be? Who knows, replied Letty indifferently. Astrid thought that one person might just be in front of him. There are people who wage war, but there are also just as much people who willingly help. I wonder why he quit the white doctors then. You have to ask him yourself, replied Letty. But I am certain something happened to him and that made him quit helping people. Letty also thought that might have been the time when Oscar met Friedhelm. Friedhelm won Oscar's trust with his naturally charming personality and had the doctor wrapped around his little finger then made him his knight. That story about Prince Friedhelm gaining a white doctor for a knight gained him quite a lot of attention that time. A young man who used to go around the world helping anyone regardless of politics came to be Friedhelm's knight. It showed that Friedhelm possessed such qualities of a king. Astrid, remember this. Oscar chose to be Prince Friedhelm's knight out of his own free will and not out of duty. He did not simply become his knight without any thought and resolve. He is most likely prepared to do everything for Prince Friedhelm's sake. Oscar's loyalty may still be on helping people as he was a doctor, but his resolve to be Friedhelm's knight might be enough to overcome his loyalty to his former occupation and be ready to kill for the sake of his cause. Continue on watching over Oscar. Protecting everyone right now when his motives are not clear may be difficult, but that is the reason I brought you with me. I have full confidence in you. Yes, your highness. 
but Letty underestimated the situation. She thought Oscar would not murder everyone in the party. He was a former doctor, after all. That was why the incident happened. They were on their fourth day of travel since their departure from the capital. The hurriedly prepared first support party had now arrived at Mount Stein, a mountain beside Mount Gran inside North Ruth territory. Up until this point, they have traveled on the main road and rested in inns. However, for tonight, they would be camping out in Mount Stein. The Knights of the Order was at first against the idea of letting Letty sleep outside, but Letty insisted they need not worry about her. If we continue at this pace, we can reach Mount Gran within a day and a few hours. Based on the worsening vision due to the darkness, they will definitely attack tonight, thought Letty as she looked up at the mountain to check its current status. She and Astrid were there to protect the party. If they were attacked when they were prepared, they could definitely do something about it. And that assurance of their strengths might have just been misplaced arrogance. That evening, they reached the bridge crossing over the canyon in Mount Stein. This road passes through Salvel, North Ruth and Kielf so it was not just a hanging bridge, but a sturdy one enough for carriages to pass through. Horses, on the other hand, are delicate creatures and hate high and unfamiliar places. Astrid, who was taking the lead, decided to cross the bridge quickly before the horses are spooked. Then he noticed something strange on the bridge in the dim twilight. A steel thread. A steel thread glimmered in the darkness. It was pulled across the bridge the horses had to cross. Astrid immediately saw what could happen. The thread would cut through the horse's legs throwing off the rider. Seeing it a few moments earlier was like a miracle. The action he took after making the decision, however, was not a miracle. They were only a result of insane physical abilities and reflexes. Stop, shouted Astrid. He knew his horse was a lost case so he jumped off it backwards to the carriage behind him and pulled on the reins for it to stop. Letty immediately understood what Astrid wanted to do so she quickly called a stormy squall with the sword of gale winds. Before this, she might not have been able to call forth such a strong wind in an instant, but thanks to her daily practice using the sword, she could call a wind so strong, it was enough to push the horses back. The carriage shook violently as the horses stopped suddenly due to Astrid's pull on their reins and being assaulted by the strong wind. In the corner of her eye, Letty saw Astrid was thrown off the bridge. She reached out to him even if she was almost falling off her seat, but her hand could not reach him. Letty knew what would happen to Astrid if he reached the bottom. She was now torn between making the decision as a queen and as a human. In the end, you are just a kind-hearted person. You are aware of that fact so you try to rein it in with the chains of reason and logic. I could even call that a talent. Friedhelm had once said this to describe Letty, a covert comment about her unsuitability for the crown. I understand that the most. I know that as a queen I should abandon Astrid here. Astrid may have perished, but thanks to his sacrifice, everyone else is alive. She should be thankful for that and proceed on to their journey. This was what her rational self told her, but another voice was shouting in her head. You have the power to save him. What's wrong with using that power? There was no time for hesitation. Letty slowly slipped off her seat on the nearly toppling carriage and jumped down to go after Astrid. She pushed herself downwards with a strong wind. She caught up with him and held him tight. At that moment when Astrid was securely in her arms, she hit a wharf. Uh, cried Letty in pain. The strong force of the hit and the succeeding pain clouded her consciousness but she still kept her tight hold on Astrid. This time, she did not have enough allowance to create a wind to break their fall. But she had the sword of iron steel inside her. It would protect her body. The sword of ground earth would heal her wounds. So this is all fine, whispered Letty. Astrid woke up feeling cold and ticklish. His consciousness slowly returning to him. It had been a long time since he woke up like this, not having any idea where he was and what he had been doing. Where am I? In my room? But why is my body all heavy and cold? Astrid found this strange and tried to sit up with his hands when pain suddenly ran through his whole body. He stopped and calmed first his breathing before rising again, slowly this time, with just his abdominal muscles. As he rose up, something fell off from his body. Water splashed him on the face. He opened his eyes to check, and for the first time in his life, he doubted his own eyes. Eh? He hurriedly called forth the sword of white light inside him to shed light around him and he could not believe what he saw. Beautiful golden hair danced in the water. This was the cause of the ticklish sensation he woke up to. Why? His memories returned all at once. They were on their way to Mount Gran and were crossing the bridge in Mount Stein when he saw the steel thread trap. He jumped off his horse to save the carriage behind him and in the process fell off the bridge. So why was Her Highness down here when he had supposedly saved her? She must have jumped off the carriage to save him and took the wounds he should have suffered. Princess. Wake up. The pale Letty did not stir. Your Highness, can you hear me? No answer still. But he had to do something. First, he had to pull her body out of the water and then treat her wounds. The bleeding would not stop if she stayed submerged in water. 
but he was taught in the academy that they should not move a person with head wounds. He did not know which to prioritize. He cursed himself for being knowledgeable on ways how to kill a person but being ignorant on how to help them. Princess called Astrid again. Then he remembered about Letty's possession of the Sword of Iron Steel. The Sword of Iron Steel, the Sword of Protection, has the ability to protect its possessor from physical attacks. A slash from a sword would only be scratch on the body. But a scratch is still a scratch. So what happens if the possessor of the sword lost consciousness and got hit several times by a ragged cliff? What if she had still been protecting him until they fell on the river and was washed away until the current had slowed down? How many wounds would she suffer? Astrid's mind went blank. Princess. Please. Open your eyes, pleaded Astrid. She still had a pulse and she was still breathing, though weakly. Shivers ran through Astrid's spine. Princess. But Letty did not even stir no matter how much he called her. Chapter 3. The Forest at Dusk. Her Highness and Astrid fell down the ravine. The support party arrived early morning at Mount Grand with ashen faces. They reported to Craig and Duke the incident that happened along the way. The sun was setting and vision was already becoming difficult due to the lack of light. Despite that, Astrid, who was taking the lead, noticed the steel thread that was pulled across the bridge. He abandoned his own horse and jumped off to pull the reins of the carriage horses behind him. He fell off after accomplishing that feat the carriage's driver's seat lurched due to the sudden movement and threw Her Highness off the bridge. We are deeply sorry. The royal knights assigned to escort the support party were given two tasks. First was to safely deliver the relief goods to Mount Gran. Second was to protect the first Princess Letitia until Mount Gran. Thanks to Astrid, they were able to accomplish the first. But as for the second one, they failed to protect the heir to the throne. We immediately looked down the bridge, but no matter how long we waited, nothing came up. The two fell off the bridge and never floated up the river. Duke understood what this implied. Her Highness had strictly ordered us to bring the goods to Mount Gran no matter what happens, so Sir Oscar said that he would at least stay and search for them. If, after searching for a whole day and he found nothing, he will go to the Melville camp and request for reinforcements. Oscar was a member of Friedhelm's private chivalric order, the Seventh Heaven. He was also a former doctor. Therefore, it seemed natural for him to volunteer and stay to search, since he was the best person to handle the situation in case the worst happened. If we go back now, we can reach there tomorrow morning. Maybe at least some of us should go back and search, suggested one of the knights. There's no need, cut Duke. As of now, it's clear to us that Her Highness and Astrid fell down the ravine. It would not take long for Sir Oscar to assess what really happened after going down by following the river's flow downstream. Besides, Sir Oscar is capable of dealing with the situation if the need arises. The situation Duke was referring to was when he found the two missing persons, Oscar can give them the medical attention they needed. It was definitely not if they were dead, even though everyone was thinking it was impossible to survive a fall from such height. But still, protested another knight. However, Duke strongly said. If Sir Oscar did not find anything after searching for a day, going to Melville and coming here would take him at least four days. If he is not yet back within four days, go ahead and check for yourselves. This would only mean one thing. Something happened and that prevented him from coming back. Such a situation could only mean that Her Highness and Astrid are alive. There is no need for you to report to me or ask for my permission. Just go. Everyone felt the emotion behind Duke's stern words. Letty was Duke's master. If anyone desired the most to go out there and search for her, it was Duke. But he had to consider the duty Letty left him. Providing this support to North Ruth was her fervent wish. He decided to stay here in Mount Gran, both to fulfill his duty and to grant Letty's wish. We understand. Let's do what Her Highness had wished us to do, agreed Bruno as the representative of the support party. Bruno was Guido's honorary knight, a member of the Second Prince's Valkyrie. He and Duke were previous acquaintances since they were both under the same faction. If you suddenly felt the urge to go and search for her, no one would blame you for it, Bruno said to Duke. I know. The royal knights went out to unload the goods from the carriage. Craig, who had been silently watching the scene, finally spoke, Her Highness has tasked me to kick the back of the young one. Is there any need for it? If someone asked Duke if he wanted to search for Letty, his answer was decided. Of course, he wanted to. But Letty clearly told him this, I already have Craig. Soon, your notion about your role will change from being a knight for my protection to being a knight of the first seed of my knights of the round. Letty left Duke in charge here for Mount Gran because she knew he could do it and it would be a good experience for him. Should I go against all that? Leave everything here and search for Her Highness? No. Her Highness would never make such an irresponsible man as her first knight. Her Highness said that she would be fine with Astrid by her side. Astrid said he'd protect Her Highness with his life. Both Her Highness and Astrid always keep their words. Then, all that was left was for him to believe in them and perform his own duties. No, thank you. 
This may sound stupid, but I believe in her highness. Besides, there was a glimmer of hope in the situation. Letty knows how to ride a horse. Therefore, she also knows how to hold her seat even if the carriage tilts. That was why he could not believe the report saying that Letty fell off the driver's seat. So why did she fall down? That too kind-hearted, Duke almost swore. Letty probably reached out her hand to save Astrid from falling. That was why she fell down. Duke was certain this was the reason. Letty may be brave, but she was not foolish. She did what she did because she knew she could save both herself and Astrid. He would believe that. Those two survived and Sir Oscar would find them. Your eyes clearly say you do not believe her highness is gone. Either you don't want to believe it, or you do not believe it at all, said Craig as he looked at Duke straight into his eyes and nodded at his own discernment. You do not believe it as well, Vice Commander? Craig just became Letty's knight a few days ago. This happened while Duke was not around so he did not know what happened and what Craig's thoughts were that made him decide to be Letty's knight. I think I am the one who cannot believe Her Highness's death the most. So you believe in Her Highness? No, it is a bit different. I just cannot believe Her Highness's death. When we were back in Ilstra, Her Highness asked me if I would go down with her. Duke was confused with Craig's words. Go down with her could be interpreted in various ways. Craig noticed the confusion of the younger knight and quickly denied any other meaning aside from what he truly meant. I meant it literally. Her Highness and I jumped down from a tower. The height could have killed us easily, but as we descended, it felt like we were enveloped in water. It was a baffling experience. Before I knew it, we had already landed safely. Craig was still mystified by this event. Letty simply told him they were lucky, but she looked like she had expected this outcome. That's why even after I heard Her Highness fell off the ravine, I still think Her Highness would show herself here unscathed. Duke felt relief at knowing Craig's belief in Letty, albeit it came from a different direction, but it also made him feel bitter somehow and realized, I see. Her Highness is truly no longer my princess alone. Having Craig as Letty's knight was reassuring. But it also meant that he was no longer the only person who understood her. Part 2 when Letty woke up, she was standing inside that silent room. Her head was a bit foggy, and she could not remember why she came there. Ahoy, Queen Letitia. What's with the unusual exhausted face? King Alexander, whispered Letty. She had no idea why she looked exhausted, though she had this strange sensation that she was hearing her own voice from afar. You smell of water, blood, and death. Where are you exactly? Letty searched for her memory to answer the question. But her mind was not yet clear, and she could not remember exactly where she was. Mount Gran. Her immediate memory was on Mount Gran. Why did you declare Mount Gran to be Salvel's territory, blurted out Letty, a question she had in mind for some time. Her mind was not functioning well and she ended up asking this trivial question instead of answering Alexander's inquiry about her present situation. But the Lion King did not mind and just answered her question. In my time, and most likely yours, Mount Gran is just a mountain with no value, but it used to be mine. So it was drained off all the minerals or ores it once possessed and closed down. I do not remember reading such history. Of course. I am talking about it being a mine during the Night King's time. It used to be a mine for the magic stone, Irinarung. It was said to have remembered the powers of the ancient times. However, it has become nothing but a stone after the gods had left and it lost its source of power. This fact was most likely erased by the people of the past and could have only been written in one of the few old books that escaped burning. They may have lost their source of power, but knowing its potential for trouble, it'd be better to have it in my hands. I declared it as part of Salvel. King Karlheinz seemed to have thought of the same thing and was successful in making it a part of Salvel's land. Letty nodded at knowing this hidden history. Now that you know, go home. Quit coming here and rest. If not, you might die. Die? Letty thought and soon her consciousness faded. Part 3 Letty slowly opened her eyes and her unstable sense of sight could only make out a foggy night sky. She closed her eyes again and unconsciously moved her hand. She groaned in pain. The moment she let out her cry, her lungs hurt. The pain caused her to cough, but it only brought more pain. Your Highness. Can you hear me? Please take a deep breath slowly. Letty's senses slowly returned. She endured the sharp pain she felt all throughout her body. A warm hand held hers and a voice kept on calling her. It was Astrid. Have you calmed down, Your Highness? Please don't force yourself to speak. You might have broken your legs and ribs. Letty wondered why upon hearing her current state. When did she do something that would break her bones? She searched her memory and immediately found the answer. They were in the middle of their journey to Mount Gran when they were caught in a trap. Astrid noticed the steel thread pulled across the bridge. He sacrificed himself to protect the support party behind him and ended up falling off the bridge. She tried saving Astrid but also fell down with him in the process. Her trip to the Night King's study was due to her losing consciousness. 
Her mind was also not clear at that time so she was not able to answer Alexander's question about where she was. I remember now. I can, paused Letty and then continued, talk slowly. Please do not push yourself, your highness. Please sleep to recover and regain strength faster. When Letty's consciousness returned, Astrid hesitatingly brought Letty out of the water and had her laid on his jacket he spread by the riverbank. He checked on her wounds and was amazed on how she was still alive. While they were still at a loss of what to do next, Letty's scratches slowly faded one by one. The Sword of Great Earth was already doing its job of healing her. If this was the case, then the best thing for them to do was to rest, let Letty heal her wounds, and regain back her strength. Are you all right? asked Letty. Thanks to your highness, I do not have any serious injuries. Please be more concerned about your own welfare. These wounds are far worse than what I have. Her wounds were serious and could have killed her. Right after their fall, she was barely breathing and Astrid could only watch her, fearful that with every breath she took, it could be her last. I am glad to hear that. I have the earth sword so. She was in pain, but all of those wounds would heal. Astrid's eyes were burning. His throat was dry and his chest felt tight. For the first time in his life, Astrid Gale felt the urge to cry. Even if your highness can heal yourself, that doesn't mean you can go out there and get hurt. Please don't say such things. Letty understood why Astrid got angry and scolded her with such a tearful voice so she decided to change the topic of their conversation. Could you tell me about the present situation? Just what you know is enough. Astrid shut his eyes and wiped off the strange hot liquid that flowed out of his eyes. It was blocking his vision after all. I think we were washed away quite far from where we fell. It was already dark when I woke up. I tried going upstream but did not find the bridge we fell from. Astrid did not know what happened to the support party after they fell. Based on Letty's last memory before falling, Astrid successfully pulled the reins of the carriage horses and she was able to call a strong wind that stopped the carriage. Whether the others were able to halt their horses, if they were all safe, or if there were some others who fell was unknown to them. Any others were washed away? I did not see anyone else. I am truly sorry your highness. I was supposed to protect you from all harm. But because of me, I'm sorry. Astrid's last memory was being thrown off the bridge. To be safe without any wounds from that fall was impossible. When he woke up, he found a severely wounded Letty and knew that she took all the injuries that should have been his. Do not blame yourself. I thought I could save you, so I did what I did. If I thought that I could not do it, then I would have not helped you. While Astrid was wallowing in self-pity, Letty was satisfied that everything went according to her plan. Astrid was safe and she, though heavily injured, was alive. All that was left was for her to heal her wounds. Astrid, said Letty weakly. I will sleep for a while. Let us talk again tomorrow. Yes. Letty no longer resisted the invitation and surrendered herself to sleep. That was more like passing out than sleeping, commented Astrid. Letty's sleep was so deep that Astrid did not even hear a slight snore from her. Astrid did not feel like he could sleep at the present situation, but he knew he needed to rest because tomorrow, he would have to carry Letty on his back until they reach Mount Gran. He needed to regain some strength and therefore, he needed to sleep. However, he could not completely shake off the fear that if he just looked elsewhere for a moment, Letty would stop breathing and she would no longer open her eyes. Oscar waited in the dark for the five men, prepared to be his accomplices for this mission. Based on their original plan, the support party was supposed to camp out here by the main road tonight and they would use that opportunity to attack them in their sleep and kill everyone. I am sorry. The party is already far gone, apologized Oscar to the five human figures approaching him from the dark. Sir Bruno suggested they should continue the journey to Mount Grand without stopping due to the lurking danger. The others agreed, since they also wanted to receive further instructions from their vice commander. Letting them leave me here to check on Her Highness and the night in case they needed medical attention was the most I could do. We should have set the trap earlier, said one of the men. I take this as my responsibility, apologized Oscar once again. Don't worry about it. We might have to abandon the plan after all, since finishing off nine perfectly healthy royal knights would be too difficult for the five of us. The only ones who fell for our trap was that kid and our main target, the princess. The other men agreed with this opinion. The knights of the Royal Chivalric Order are well versed in hand-to-hand -hand combat. That was the reason they had set up a trap, to at least reduce their number. We'll join you then Sir Oscar on your search for Her Highness's corpse. If we could just bring back at least a part of her to Lord Lowenstein, his lordship would believe our success. Such a pity. She was a young and beautiful lady. Everyone fell silent at these words. The five assailants did not have anything against Letty. They simply had their own personal reasons for joining this mission. Some were lured by the money. One was bound by duty and another was doing this for his master. Then let us hope to at least find a beautiful corpse, said Oscar. Too much sympathy for their victim would prevent them from accomplishing their mission. A night had passed since the day they fell off the bridge. The sun's rays woke up Astrid. 
he snapped out of his sleep and immediately checked on Letty. Her Highness is all right. Yes, I am alive and will continue to be ever since I regained consciousness. I only have to recover. Your Highness. Astrid was surprised upon hearing Letty speak. He thought she was still asleep. Her voice now sounded stronger. I was awake already before you did, but I was afraid to get up on my own, so I waited for you. Could you lend me a hand? Of course. Astrid took Letty's hand and placed his other hand on her back to support her as she sat up. He was worried Letty would be in pain as she moved, but she seemed fine. He did think that her hand was unusually hot. He stared at his hands, still feeling the heat and asked, Your Highness, do you have a fever? Well, I did break some of my bones so it is natural for me to have one. My mind, however, is clear so this is just a slight fever. I think my ribs have mended but not completely, so I still cannot speak loudly. I can move my legs as well, but it still hurts so I cannot walk without support. Thank goodness. Letty was indeed on the road to recovery. Her face color was obviously better compared to last night. She would be a whole lot better tomorrow and then they could start moving. Your Highness, let us spend the day here. We could climb up after you have regained enough strength. I would search for now where we can go from here. No. We will go now. We do not have time, Letty said as she looked up at the rising sun. The day was moving fast. But pushing yourself might worsen your highness's injuries. I understand that we need to reach Mount Gran as early as possible, but, hesitated Astrid. Oscar will come. Letty was not able to think much last night. But this morning, with the fog cleared from her mind, she was able to consider the situation more carefully. Tell me Astrid, do you think anyone would have survived that fall? I think no one would. Yes, I think so too. The support party would have looked down immediately to check on us. If they judged at that point there was still hope for us, they would have gone down to search for us and we would have been found last night. Since no one found us, they have thought we are most likely dead. Yes. The support party would immediately contact the nearest camp of the order, which for this case was the Melville camp. Then, they would dispatch a search party to look for them. Communication would probably take a few days, so they could just wait for help to find them. However, with the current situation they cannot afford to wait simply for help to come. The support party needs to continue to Mount Gran, so they would at least leave one member to search for my body. That person would be Oscar. Because Mr. Oscar will want to complete the job in case we are still alive. You are correct. He is not a knight of the order, but Friedhelm's knight. He was given permission to join the support party and could be allowed to work alone. Besides, he is also a doctor. He was a doctor known for his skills worthy of being awarded an order. He could tell the other members of the support party that he was the best person to do the search since he could provide medical attention if it was needed. Is it not ironic? A doctor who was supposed to save lives is coming after us to end ours. If Mr. Oscar is alone, I can handle him. As long as we are not caught off guard, I will not lose to him. If he is alone, emphasized Letty. Letty was worried about that before since Oscar was leaving coded messages throughout their journey. These messages could be for Lowenstein's men. The family did not want her gaining points as the heir to the crown so they wanted to make her plan of supporting North Ruth fail. They considered that the success of this plan would be a big achievement for her. Oscar is not our only enemy. Oscar was with us when we were trapped, so he could not possibly be the one who pulled the steel thread across the bridge. He is definitely helped by some men prepared by Lowenstein and their job was most likely not only to lay a trap. They were also supposed to finish off those who survived the trap, concluded Astrid. And the main target of that trap, Her Royal Highness, fell off the bridge and died. This was the last information they had and she could not read what their next move could have been. Since Letty died, would they have abandoned the rest of their plan to kill the survivors? Would they destroy the goods to be delivered? Or would they continue as planned and kill everyone? If she cannot read their move correctly, then she would have to consider the worst-case situation. If we assume they would continue to attack the support party, stipulated Letty while wishing to let her preparations be for naught and everything would just end with her making a stupid decision. Then shall we catch up with the support party, asked Astrid. The night has passed. It would be impossible for us. The party would immediately head to Mount Gran and we are heading towards there as well, but by foot. We cannot catch up with the speed of horses. We have to give up on that. They were trapped during the evening just as vision was getting difficult due to the dwindling daylight. The party would most likely decide to camp out, cautious of a second trap, to let the blinding darkness of the night pass. They would continue their journey the next morning. Letty hoped they were safe and already on the move. Astrid seemed to have read her thoughts and softly spoke, then, it is possible that the attack was finished last night. Attacking nine royal knights on their guard will be difficult. But it can be easier while they are traveling. We have to believe that. Letty and Astrid did not know that the five assailants had already abandoned their plan last night. Letty and Astrid's decision to assume the worst made them trod with heavy feet. Your Highness, there are fishes in this river. 
People may go down here to fish. Then there might be a ladder we can use to go up. Shall we go upstream or downstream? Going downstream is less stressful. They continued on walking by the river as they searched for a place they could climb up while taking frequent rests. The riverside was difficult to walk on and Letty almost tripped several times, but they continued to move slowly and carefully. There it is. I was right. People do come down here. Up ahead of them was a cliff that looked like a flight of stairs made of stone. Some modifications were even made on it to make it easier to climb up. But still, it was a cliff that just looked like stairs. They would still need to support themselves with both of their hands or else they could easily fall off. Letty stared at the top and told herself to pull herself together. Climb this up and you will be in the forest. Hiding yourself will be easier there. Just a bit more, Letty. I will be a heavy burden to you, but could you help me climb up? Of course, your highness. I will do my best. As they climbed up, they almost fell down several times. Their hands slipped that they unconsciously clawed in their nails to the rock and they had to endure being hit by small stones falling from above. The unnatural posture they had to sustain as they climbed up hurt Letty's still mending bones. She was sweating profusely and was feeling nauseous. She could feel vile gathering down her throat, but with the strength of will, she continued the climb and at the last step, Astrid pulled her up. They had at last crawled up their way to the top. Let me panted Letty. Rest for a while. She took deep breaths to calm herself, but she could feel pain in her whole body. Her head was spinning and she did not feel well. Astrid soon stood up and said, I will erase our tracks so that Mr. Oscar would not find us. Their boots left tracks on the cliff they climbed up and traces of handprints could be found on the rock wall. Letty was about to nod in agreement to Astrid's idea since they were not supposed to leave clues about their whereabouts when she thought otherwise. If I were searching for a body, I would go downstream assuming it was washed away. But if I did not find anything, not even traces of it, I would give up the search thinking that to search further would be difficult. So what will I do next after that? Oscar could go and help attack the party. He could still catch up if he hurried. Astrid, wait called Letty. She gave him the ribbon tying her hair. Go and put this somewhere they can easily find. Astrid looked at the ribbon, puzzled at Letty's suggestion. If Oscar knew that we were alive, he would have some of the men, maybe at least half of the group, to help him search and finish us. Is your highness planning to be the bait to reduce the men that would go after the support party? I am against that plan, disagreed Astrid. Your highness cannot move well now. We can't easily escape an attack. We also don't know how many there are. You do not have to think hard about it. We only need to search for a place to hide and rest today. If we can delay them for a day, they can no longer catch up with the support party. The most Letty could do now was to help the support party. If there would be fewer enemies for them to face, then they would have higher chances of reaching Mount Grand safely. Besides, you are here. I am sorry, but let me believe in you. That's sly, your highness. Women are sly creatures. Better remember that. The person he likes, the person adores, told him that she believes in him. He was against her plan, but he could not help the desire to prove to her that he was worthy of her trust. Thus, despite his opposition with the plan, Astrid followed Letty's order and placed the ribbon somewhere eye-catching. Now, they would know Her Highness is alive and climbed up the cliff. They would definitely search for us and finish their job. I hate this. They are both people of Salvel and yet they are willing to kill Her Highness. Astrid did not understand the complexity of politics. They were all doing their own thing and pulling each other down. He truly could not comprehend why they would not want to cooperate and help Letty. He knew he was not meant for this convoluted politics. Your Highness, I have placed the, Astrid was not able to complete his sentence and screamed, Your Highness. Letty was sitting up when he left. So why was she lying unconscious on the ground? Your Highness, shouted Astrid by Letty's ear as he tried to wake her. He placed a hand on her shoulder and noticed what was wrong. She is burning up. Letty said this morning that she had a slight fever, but she was fine. But after walking such a distance and climbing up the cliff, the physical strain her body had to endure caused her fever to rise. I am all right. I was just a little dizzy and felt cold. We should go. Oscar is coming. I will carry your highness on my back. Please, get on. Just lend me a hand. I am too heavy for you. Astrid immediately understood to whom he was compared with. If he was Duke, Letty would have not hesitated or she would have even ordered him to carry her. He suddenly wanted to grow up fast, to be taller and stronger, just like Duke. I am trained. I can carry your highness until we find a place to hide. Then, I shall accept your offer. Tell me at once when you are tired. I will walk on my own. Astrid carried Letty on his back and started walking into the forest. They were walking on a trail used by the locals to go down the valley so it was relatively easier to walk. After walking for some time, they took a turn to enter the woods untainted by human activities. My back feels hot. Her Highness's fever is high. 
I should find a place to rest soon. He could hear Letty's shallow and fast breaths. He was certain the slight movement of being carried was tough on her. He walked slowly as he suppressed his frustration in searching for a place to hide. Oh, this place, Astrid stopped walking in front of a tree. The earth under the large roots of the tree crumbled creating a space that can fit one person. The entrance is covered by the bushes so it was hard to find. Your Highness, please rest here for a while. I think one person can fit inside. There was no sign of Oscar following them. She could rest there for the whole day and come tomorrow, they could head to Mount Grand while being cautious. Things looked like they could go well. I will go and check the area. We can do some preparations if we at least know how many we are up against. Astrid put Letty down and was about to go when Letty stopped him. Wait for a moment, Astrid. She heard footsteps approaching. The sound reverberating on the ground on which she laid woke Letty from her sleep. She slowly opened her eyes and checked the sun's position. It was past noon, but still quite early to be called evening. She silently wished for night to hurry and claim the sky as she once again closed her eyes when she suddenly realized something was not right. Those footsteps are not Astrid's. Astrid has the habit of silencing his footsteps due to his past occupation of being an assassin. He usually makes his footsteps sound intentionally to be more normal like everyone else. So why would he make his footsteps heard when they were on the run from Oscar and his colleagues? Then, one thing was clear. The approaching person was not the young knight. It could be from one of the people searching for the princess to kill her. What should I do? Astrid is nowhere nearby. If he finds me, I will have to deal with this enemy alone. Letty's body started to tremble. She fervently prayed for the man to go and look somewhere else, but her prayers were not answered. The footsteps only sounded clearer and louder now. I am in no sound condition to make a sound decision. I cannot control the knight sword well enough to render him unconscious in one blow. I would have to kill him in one swift attack. But she did not want to do that. To kill a person because she was not feeling well is not an excuse. It is not something a human would do. The footsteps came closer and Letty considered what to do. Her heart raced so fast, she worried the man might hear its drumming. Cold sweat ran down her spine as she covered her mouth and desperately held her breath. She was now trembling, not because of the fever, but of fear. The bushes around her rustled, she felt like the unwanted visitor could hear her heartbeat. No, please. Do not come any closer. I will have to kill you. She closed her eyes tightly and held her breath. Please. Just go. I found you. Letty heard the voice nearby. She cupped her mouth, desperately stopping herself from screaming. She could not open her eyes. She stayed still until she heard a sigh. TSK. I thought I had her. She might have gone to the main road already. One of the attackers found the little alcove under the route, but there was no one there. Not even a sign someone stayed there before. She heard the footsteps going away. Letty finally removed her hand from her mouth when she could no longer hear the footsteps. Her limbs were still shaking slightly and her breath was ragged. I am safe. Letty was not sleeping in the alcove. Astrid found it easily while they were walking. It would be a lot easier for those assailants purposely searching for her to notice it. However, humans no longer tend to look around the area after they think they found the place. Letty decided to use that mentality to trick the enemy. The alcove served as a decoy while she was truly hiding among the bushes nearby. I was afraid the worst would happen. Letty calmed herself down and felt now that the real Astrid is coming. There was no sound in his footsteps, but she could tell from the movement of the wind. Letty's daily practice of using the sword of gale winds made her sensitive even to the slightest movement in the air. Your Highness, I found four men in addition to Mr. Oscar. Add another one. He just passed by here, calmly said Letty. Astrid immediately worried about Letty, but she just dismissed his concern. No need to apologize. He did not find me. Anyway, how were Oscar and his friends? It looked like it was time for them to gather again since all of them went towards the same direction. Five men and Oscar, a total of six people were looking for them. Considering these men were half of the men Lowenstein prepared for this mission, then it meant that there were five more men left to attack the support party. Five people would not be a problem for nine royal knights. Letty was glad her plan worked. But that man thought that I was no longer in the forest and on the main road. That is not good for us. If they believe that, they might catch up with the others and help in attacking the support party. The sun had just passed its peak now. If the support party left early this morning, Oscar's group might catch up with them. There was enough possibility the support party would encounter problems and stop their journey for a while. If we could at least detain them here, they could no longer catch up with the others if they leave tomorrow morning. So how to keep them here? If they made any sudden moves, the attackers would know their location and waste their success in fooling the men that they were no longer there. No good idea came out of Letty's clouded mind. Just keeping herself conscious was already taking a lot of effort for her part. Detain six people, whispered Astrid. 
Letty shivered, not due to the lowering temperature as the sun declined, but because of Astrid. She heard not a hint of emotion from the lad's voice. As the sun sets, blanketing the woods in darkness, the usual gentleness found in Astrid's green eyes also vanished. He was now thinking purely based on instinct. Stop. Your Highness? Astrid asked as he blinked repeatedly. You were not thinking of doing something foolish, were you? Tell me you were not thinking of killing all those six men alone. I can do it, Your Highness. You need not worry about me. As long as I surprise them and kill them in an instant. Stop that. I do not want you to do that. Astrid simply gave her a troubled smile. But if we let them be, Mr. Oscar and the rest would join the others who went after the support party. The Royal Knights could die, right, Your Highness? And keeping them alive is too much trouble and a threat to us. I know that. I understand that you can do it and that it is the best way to deal with this situation, hurriedly said Letty. Her head was still not clear and she could not explain herself well. Remember Astrid that you scolded me for saving you because I knew I could do it. She jumped off the bridge to protect him. She did that because she knew the healing sword, Grand Earth, would heal her wounds. Astrid got angry about that. This was just the same thing. You have the power to kill those six people easily, so you would do it. But I do not want you to be a sword to hurt someone to protect another. I want you to use your power to protect both your friends and your enemies. If Astrid's appearance were what he truly is, a recently knighted young lad, he would have not thought of killing those people. Or even if he did, he would have given up on the idea since it would be impossible for him to carry it out alone. I understand that I am pushing my own ideals to you. But I do not want you to say that you killed six people because you could do it. Letty started regretting her present state of powerlessness. If only she could use the Night King's sword properly, she could easily prevent those men from leaving to join the others. I understand. I will just take a look at their present situation. I will try to find out what their plan will be so we could have our own. Please wait here, your highness until I return. Astrid was the one who gave in. He was suggesting a compromise to have more time to make their decision. I see. You may go. Be careful. Letty agreed to Astrid's suggestion. She also wanted more time to think about how to stop Oscar from going after them. Wake me up upon your return, bid Letty as she closed her eyes to rest once again. The sunset painted the forest in a dusk hue. Vision had become difficult due to the lack of light, but Astrid continued on walking into the forest, his footsteps silent. If he would attack Oscar and company, this was the best time to do it or else they would come to a decision to go to the main road. I'm sorry your highness. Astrid did not understand at first why Letty stopped him. He could easily kill six people, so he would do it. It was just that simple. But Letty did not agree with that. He understood now why. Ah, I did it again. I really am different from normal people. Astrid had always felt that he makes mistakes in the most basic of things. Whenever he realizes he made a mistake, he could not help but worry that maybe he was just saying he wanted to be a true knight. I think, whispered Astrid. I think I'm scared. He was about to do something he had never done before. Up until now, he only did things he knew he could do. But he did not mind taking that risk of failing, if succeeding would mean granting her wish. He repeatedly closed and opened his fist to calm himself and his tensed feet. He was feeling nervous for the first time in his life. I will stop those six people without killing them. Letty wished him to be a sword that protects both friends and enemies. Astrid also wanted to be like that. Astrid found the five men talking. As expected, they were already discussing the possibility Letty was no longer in the forest and that they should hurry out to the main road. However, Oscar was not among them. Well, he did leave the support party to search for us. If he did not bring supplies with him, he would be expected to head somewhere, like the Melville camp or go to Mount Gran, unless he wanted to look suspicious. Besides, Oscar would not lend much power to the attackers even if he joined the ones who will attack the support party. The problem is the five men here. The men seemed to have reached a decision and they were preparing to leave. Each one of them was focused on their own task. Astrid could not let this good opportunity pass. Let's go first to that man far from the others. The said man was loading their baggage on the horses. Astrid snuck behind him and struck the back of his head. In an instant, the man was rendered unconscious. Astrid supported the man's body and carefully laid it on the ground. No one noticed him. The rest are too close to each other. I should split them up. Astrid took the sword of the unconscious man and threw it towards the men. The sword rattled some leaves on the trees and fell on the ground with a large thud. What's that? The four men easily noticed the sword that came out of nowhere and the noise of the leaves despite the lack of wind. Astrid used this confusion to attack the man farthest from the others. Astrid did the same thing he did to the first man. He hit the back of the head causing a concussion rendering the man unconscious. He supported the body, laid it on the ground, and hit himself again. There's something here. Be careful, cried one of the remaining men. 
The three men finally noticed something was amiss. All of a sudden, one of them was down and another was missing. They did not feel any presence and they did not hear a sound. The deafening darkness made them tremble in fear. We'd better stick together, suggested one. Astrid nodded silently at their decision. It was the correct thing to do, so Astrid had to separate them once again to commence his attack. Then, I'd have to scare them more. Astrid cut the reins of the horse tied to the tree in advance. Then he aimed a small stone and flicked it to the horse. The horse neighed at the sudden pain and ran away. The sudden dashing out of the horse added to the fear the three men were experiencing. Oi, don't tell me this is. Her Highness's ghost? Of course not. She's alive, remember. But what if those handprints belonged to Her Highness's corpse climbing up the cliff? The assailant seemed to be truly sorry for Letty's plight. Astrid was thankful for the strange fear that overcame the men. It was the perfect chance for his next attack. You're next now. Go for them, thought Astrid as he threw another stone at the other horse. The startled animal went straight for the men as if attacking them. What now? What's happening? Being run through a horse could at least cost them a few broken bones. So despite their initial surprise, they were still able to run for their lives. Astrid did not let this opportunity pass. The men's guard was down. He started with the one closest to him. He no longer had any time to go behind the man first, so he jumped right in front of the man and landed a punch to his stomach. When he bent forward due to the pain, Astrid went behind and dealt the final blow to render him unconscious. Last two. Speed is the name of the game now. Doing his attack in stealth was no longer a concern for him, so he did not support the body of his third victim. The sound of the body hitting the ground called the other two's attention. Oi. What? One of the men drew his sword. Astrid exhaled sharply and dashed to the man. He twisted the hand holding the sword followed by a punch at the stomach. The man fell to the ground. Just one more. The last man drew his sword as well and swung it to the approaching Astrid. Astrid slid down his sleeves the knife he was keeping in his uniform. He targeted the hilt of the sword to disarm the man. When he suddenly felt his feet were stuck. You bastard. One of the men Astrid hit first was now awake and held his feet tightly so that he could feel the man's nails dig into the skin. The other man was fast approaching with his sword ready to cut Astrid. Astrid did not even have the time to analyze his situation. There was no room for hesitation. I did it. All five of them are alive, huffed Astrid as he leaned his exhausted body on the tree. He held up his bleeding left arm in front of him. It was throbbing with pain and he should stop it from bleeding immediately. He was wounded in that fight with the last man awake. The man was brandishing his sword and he could not move because another man held his foot. To protect himself, he raised his left arm. The wound was deep, but thanks to that, he was able to recover quickly and successfully rendered the last attacker unconscious. The wound was worth it. I did it, your highness, whispered Astrid. He wanted Letty to praise him, but he decided to keep this encounter a secret. He could just tell Letty that the men decided to stay for the night and no longer join the others. All that was left now was some final touches to ensure the men would not go after them and abandon their mission of searching for Letty or attacking the support party. Astrid returned once to where Letty was asleep. He took out the sword of white light and pierced it into Letty's shadow. Hey, I know you're there. Come and help, called out Astrid into Letty's shadow. From the darkness of the shadow came forth a deeper darkness. It squirmed out until a black hand came out of the dark. They'll be surprised when they wake up, commented Astrid as he looked at his completed masterpiece. The supplies of the attackers, together with their swords, were scattered around the area. Their limbs were tied up by ivy and numerous black handprints the size of a child's hand could be found everywhere. Anyone who saw this would only lead to one conclusion, there is a monster in the mountain. I just hope they get so scared and go down the mountain already. If this worked, then they would no longer pursue Letty and she could focus on healing herself. With their pursuers gone, there was no need for them to hurry and she would no longer have to push herself too much. Astrid believed that this was enough. While Letty and Astrid were fending for their life, Duke North Ruth was busy going around the temporary shelter at the northern foot of Mount Gran. The support party from Salvel had arrived this morning. They brought with them two doctors and an ample supply of medicine and tents. The party was escorted by nine royal knights and an honorary knight from the private order of the second prince. He said his hometown was around the area. Princess Letitia was nowhere in sight, but this was expected. Letty's job was not to care for the sick and wounded at Mount Gran. It was to get the approval for her proposed support program for North Ruth. Naturally, she would stay in the capital to finish other business related to this and just send the first party ahead. She could then follow with the second or even third party afterwards. However, the support party who were supposed to be basking in the heartfelt gratitude of everyone looked gloomy. Now, this was unusual. Did something happen at the capital? murmured the Duke. All his life, he had made himself aware about Salvel's situation in order to look for any weakness he could exploit later on. 
This might be the reason why he was able to pick up this abnormality. He found one disheartened knight talking with his colleague, quietly, he closed in on them and strained his ears to listen to their conversation. Her Highness, that height. Falling, no chance. Duke North Ruth could only hear parts of the conversation, but it was enough for him to deduce what happened. He took some more steps closer to the conversing knights when he saw the back of someone he recently was acquainted with. Duke Northruth has found himself liking this royal knight, Duke Barchet. This younger knight was infinitely more amiable than that stoic border general. Duke. Don't you find Northruth better? Why don't you come and join me? I humbly decline the offer, your grace. You'll never have to worry about women or alcohol in your life if you do. I am sorry, but I do not drink while on duty. As for women, if your grace can find someone more beautiful than my master, then I will consider. Duke Northruth thought of his wives. If Duke wants someone more beautiful than Letty, then the only ones that could compete with her would be, will alluring and sensual ladies be enough? No. I prefer the pure and innocent beauties. Duke used Letty as his excuse knowing that there were not many who could surpass her superior looks. But Duke North Ruth was not yet finished. He grabbed Duke's shoulders and smirked. But I've heard that the said royal beauty fell down a cliff on her way back to the capital. Technically, Letty fell down, not from a cliff, but from a bridge and on her way back to Mount Gran, not back to the capital. Duke North Ruth was waiting for Duke to ask where he got his information, but the knight did not fall for his trap. Her Highness is in the capital. But I heard the other knights talking about it. She is not dead, is she? My master is still young and quite a frequent victim of such rumors, in which one seemed to have reached your grace's ears, answered Duke nonchalantly, but deep inside, he was having an extremely throbbing headache. There were some knights who did not see North Ruth as an enemy and had accidentally let information about Letty leak out. Duke understood why they would feel that way, Salvel and North Ruth shared the same race and language as well as history. But even if the princess could trick those close to her, I will never be fooled, declared Duke North Ruth. Trick, rudely questioned Duke. Duke North Ruth let this lapse in manner slide. That woman will not die just from falling down the cliff. I'd believe that story if it happened to someone else, but not her. I've seen with my own eyes how Princess Letitia jumped down a tower and survived it, spitted the Duke. I think I've heard this before, thought Duke. He heard it from Craig. The vice commander said that he jumped down from a high place with Her Highness. Just what did happen in Ilstra? What absurdity did Letty do there? Princess Letitia is alive and she will fulfill her promise with me. But to need to trick her family is one tiresome thing to do. Duke excused himself from Duke Northruth, the man who came close to the truth, interpreted the facts he gathered dragging him further from the truth and got satisfied with his own deductions. Duke could have stayed for a bit longer, but the possibility of him saying something he should not was there and he did not want to risk it. So Duke Northruth and Vice Commander believe in her. Then she was alive for sure. He was not wrong in believing that. And the other's belief in her strengthened his belief. Duke could not help sighing at this strange mixture of emotion he felt when he realized that both Craig and Duke Northruth believed in Letty. The second night after their fall from the bridge had passed. Letty slowly woke up as the morning sun shined on her. Out of habit, she tried to wake up on her own and supported herself with her hands when she remembered that she was injured. She awaited the piercing pain she felt yesterday in her every move, but she only felt a dull pain. Good morning, you highness. How are you feeling? Good morning. I feel a lot better now. My fever has gone down as well. When she got up, Astrid's jacket slid off from her body. She picked it up and returned it to Astrid when she noticed the red stain on the cloth wrapped around his left arm. You are wounded. Since when? I think I hit it when I fell off the bridge. I've had it since yesterday. It's not a deep wound, so please don't worry. The blood stain was still bright. The wound had not yet closed. Suspicious of Astrid's answer, Letty asked him to show her the wound. You could have not possibly given it proper care since it is on your other arm. Ah, I think your highness should not see this now. I am not afraid of blood. If I were, I should have swooned before during that incident on the magic circle. Letty ignored Astrid's protest and took off the makeshift bandage. As she thought, the wound was still fresh and it could not possibly be from being hit. It was clearly a cut wound, most probably from a blade. The wound was enough for Letty to know what happened last night. I am sorry. You went to detain them alone, didn't you? No, denied Astrid. I was the one who pushed you, saying that I believe you could do it. Allow me to apologize. If Astrid had killed them, he could have survived the whole battle without a wound. But since Letty asked him to spare them, he followed her wish for him to be a sword that protects both his enemies and friends and got wounded in the process. It is my fault. I was not strong enough and I got careless at the end and… No, cut Letty. Let me take the blame for this. From now on, you will not push yourself too hard. I have recovered enough to walk alone, albeit slowly. I can easily protect us both. 
Letty tightly tied the cloth on Astrid's wound. A night had passed, and yet it was still bleeding. He most likely had lost a significant amount of blood already. I can handle such wounds because of the Earth Sword. I would still heal even if my bones break. But Astrid is a normal person. If the wound worsens, it could put his life in danger. They did not have time to wait for her full recovery. They had to reach Mount Grant at the earliest possible time to have a doctor look at Astrid's wound. The most they could do was to wash the wound with the water from the river and tie it up to at least control the bleeding. Tell me what you did last night, asked Letty. I, I found the five assailants last night and it was just like what your highness said. They were already discussing how they would go after the support party. I decided to attack them while they were preparing to leave. I rendered each one unconscious without revealing myself and that caused them to think that it was the princess's corpse haunting them. They were terrified. Mr. Oscar was not there so maybe he went on ahead of them. Now, that would stir up another interesting rumor in the capital when I get home. After I have successfully put all of them down, I scattered around their supplies and asked black hands to leave handprints all over the place. I just hoped that'd be enough to scare them down the mountain. Letty could easily see how these men would spread this story once they were back to the capital. She would once again be the subject of gossip with a touch of the supernatural. I also took some food and water from their supplies. Could you bring yourself to eat something? They fell down the bridge without any supplies on their person. They already consumed yesterday the emergency food stashed in Astrid's uniform and Letty already drank the water in his wineskin since it was all she could afford to pass down her throat. I should try and emulate this calm and composed attitude you are showing right now, said Letty in admiration. Thank you for the food. I should be eating some to have energy so I would force myself to swallow. Their worries were slowly starting to be taken care of. At least for now, they did not have to worry about food. Then, we should get going now and walk to Mount Gran. Can you walk? Yes, your highness, assured Astrid. For now, they did all that they could. All that was left was to pray that they would not find any corpse from the support party. Letty and Astrid continued on walking the mountain trail until they reached the main road before noontime. Now, their walk would be relatively easier. Then, they felt this strong, hot wind blowing in their direction. The wind carried a burnt scent. There is fire somewhere near here. Before they left Mount Gran, they had already considered the possibility of Mount Stein being affected by the heat wave even if it had never happened before. Should we move forward or retreat? asked Letty. I could not believe I would be encountering a pincer attack even though we are not at war. She tried to make light of the situation to hide the building turmoil inside her. She was now forced, literally, to choose her path. Senpai said that if we ever get caught in a pincer attack, we could go and break through the ranks up ahead and take the enemy's commander's head. That is quite an extreme piece of advice. Duke is always shocked by Letty's inclination for extremely dramatic comments, but it seems that he also has the same penchant for it when he is with his colleagues. Maybe there is truly wisdom in the advice of her retainer this time. Then, let us heed that advice and go forward. Besides, with you by my side, I think we could get, not just the head of the enemy's general, but to bring a whole country down. If you were with Duke Senpai? If I have my complete knights of the round, then it will be a content we would bring down. Letty's words were filled with strength and determination. Astrid nodded his agreement, but thought that was not what I wanted to hear. Her Highness evaded my question. He felt that Letty unconsciously avoided comparing him with Duke simply because they were still not in the same category to be compared. Astrid clenched his fist in frustration, and then noticed something strange. Astrid unwittingly made a fist with his injured arm and yet he did not feel any pain. He touched the area around the wound. It was hot. This is bad. I'm not feeling anything here. It has gone numb, assessed Astrid and yet he determinately told himself that he could still go. Letty endured numerous injuries, far worse than this. He could not let himself be defeated by this wound. Astrid, we should go. Are you certain you are fine? Yes, I am. They resumed their journey and walked on. However, they stopped again around noon. When they reached a clearing after walking the whole morning, the main road they were heading already had traces of being burnt. Letty stooped down to touch the ground. It is still hot. It would not be strange if another fire sparks here. I think we are only heading towards a wall of fire. They did not know how big the fire was. To go and see the fire was too dangerous since they were downwind. Let us take a detour. We will be going farther from the main road, but safety is our top priority. Astrid agreed with Letty's suggestion. Left or right? Letty had to choose which way they should go. The chances were the same, whichever path she chose, the possibility of encountering a wildfire was there. Letty recalled the map of the area embedded in her head. The heat wave from Ilstra was most likely coming from the south of the mountain. If the fire started there, then they should head towards the eastern side to go against the wind direction. As Letty made her choice, she turned around to check on Astrid. He was turning pale. Astrid, are you all right? Astrid smiled weakly at Letty. 
since he did not seem to be aware of his worsening situation, Letty pointed it out to him. Letty reached her head and touched the young knight's forehead. You have a fever, she declared. Astrid's wound had worsened just as Letty feared. He could probably overcome this if he had enough strength, but he could only have so much of it. He was just a boy, after all. I am all right, your highness. I can still walk. Then let us go back to the main road. We may have to face the five assailants, but I can manage them now. Please, don't. If that happens, then I should have just killed them. I don't want my decision to spare their lives to be the wrong one. Please. Let us go on. What would happen if Letty encounters their attackers while supporting the injured Astrid? She would have to fight them, and this time, she might not have the luxury of keeping them alive. We will after we have taken a short rest under the shade of the trees. Astrid followed Letty's lead and sat down for a while. His body was worn out more than he had thought. Your Highness, where will we be headed? We will take a detour to the eastern side. I suggest you pray we do not encounter any fires along the way. Letty could not say for how long Astrid could continue walking. But if he could hang on and walk all the way down the mountain, then she could let him stay somewhere safe and rest while she goes to Mount Gran to seek help. She would run all the way to the temporary evacuation site even if it broke her legs. But all of that depends if they could make it down the mountain, because there is also the other possibility that they could not reach the foot at all. Astrid, thanks to the Sword of Iron Steel, I am protected against most wounds. The Sword of Great Earth, on the other hand, hastens my recovery. But if I get engulfed in a sea of fire, I will still die. She probably has the ability to block fire, but she did not know how to use it. She needed enough practice to be able to do something like that with her powers, just like learning how to make it rain. To be honest, I do not want to have this kind of conversation. But we do not know what lies ahead. I suggest we entrust our last words to each other. Last words? I only have one thing to say. If I end up dying here, I want you to tell Prince Friedhelm, I leave everything up to you. He will know what it means. Letty did only have one thing to say. Astrid thought she would have a lot for her country and her family so he was surprised at the sparsity of it. Is that all, your highness? Yes. Make sure you tell it to the right person. Letty specifically chose Friedhelm to take care of the rest, meaning she was choosing him to be the king. It cannot be Guido Onyesama. He is not a natural child of the king. Friedhelm would understand that she chose him because she had valid reasons to do so. If he receives her last words, he would no longer hesitate to win against Guido to get the throne. Besides, there was also the matter of Astrid. Friedhelm would also be able to decipher the hidden message she sent to him by asking Astrid to deliver to him her last words. He would understand that she was also leaving this young knight in his capable hands. He would notice the darkness Astrid possessed and have the magnanimity to embrace that. If Astrid would not wish to be his knight, then he could help him be the commander of the order. How about you Astrid? Any message to your home? You may tell me anything. Letty purposely did not ask for his family because even if he did, he had surely abandoned all ties with them when he decided to go to Salvel. Your Highness once told me to think about my future. Ah, yes, before I went to Ilstra. Astrid visited the royal villa, Letty's residence, that day to deliver a message to her younger brother, Leonhardt. Letty saw him and asked him what he planned to do. She introduced to him the possibility of being the commander of the order. She told him to think about it and that became the end of their conversation. I have thought about it since then. Your Highness told me that I could be a true knight if I become commander. But I realized that I want to help people, not because I am a knight, but because helping others is the right thing to do. If that leads to me becoming the commander, then I would gladly accept it. If he were not a knight, would he stop helping people? No, that was not it, for him being a knight is not being one by name, but by having the heart to be one and acting according to it. An admirable answer Astrid. The will alone to strive and be one is commendable already. Letty clearly understood what Astrid wanted to say. When Friedhelm asked him this same question before, he was not able to explain himself well, but the prince did tell him that an intelligent person would understand him. But there is no need to hurry. You are young and full of potential. No, your highness. I no longer have time. Your highness's coronation is not that far away. Friedhelm told him he was running out of time. And his highness was right. Soon enough, all of the twelve seats would be filled. Even if he had potential, he did not have time to harness it fully. My dream changed a little after meeting your highness. Before, I just wanted to be a knight. Now, I do not want to be just a royal knight of the royal chivalric order. I want to be a knight for a master I have chosen. He wanted to be just like his senior, Duke, whom Letty relied on. He wanted to stand by her side and be her support. He wanted to be closer to her and stronger than anyone was. I want to be the knight of the first seat of the round. Letty was surprised for a moment upon hearing his newfound dream and then whispered, I see. She looked at Astrid's eyes and asked if he was certain of it. Then you are challenging Duke. 
yes, it will be like that. Then, Letty suddenly remembered something her other knight told her before. Craig told me that the childhood dream of every boy in Salvel was to be knight of the round. I see now you have truly become a Salvelian. Eh, cried a surprised Astrid. Your highness took it that way? Anyone who could have heard their conversation would lead them to the conclusion that Astrid wanted to be Letty's knight. Astrid was flustered. He racked his brain trying to find where Letty could have misunderstood him. Letty could not hold her laugh anymore. I was just joking. I understood perfectly what you meant. But you currently cannot win against Duke. I was the one who chose him, and I would only choose an excellent man. I know, but I do not plan on losing. Astrid seriously looked at Letty's eyes, or rather passed them, because he was truly looking at Duke with challenge in his eyes. Well, I do not hate ambitious men. Astrid was surprised at Letty's words. Does this mean I can still hope? As a man? When Astrid confessed his feelings to Letty before, she completely brushed him off. But now, she said she did not hate him. It was a huge improvement for him. Let me be clear. I do not like younger men. I cannot, for an eternity, return your feelings. Then I will be 18 years old from now on. There, I am older than your highness. Astrid thought that he had the most brilliant idea. But Letty just sighed at his antics. Age is not something you declare on your own, Astrid. But no one knows when I was born. I just declared myself 14 that time because I copied everyone else's age to enter the academy. So I can be 18. I see, nodded Letty, but not about Astrid being 18, rather, then are you sure you are not 13 or 14 now instead of 16? I have always thought you looked young for your age. Eh? That's how your highness thinks? That's a definite no. In a few years, I will grow taller and stronger. I will be just like him, Astrid hoped for his future. Astrid was disappointed when Letty said he looked younger, but the sparkle in his eyes returned soon after. Letty understood Astrid's quiet thought. Have you said everything then? Yes, your highness. Astrid was able to regain some of his strength with this short rest. Letty stood up and lent him a hand. Let us go. They headed to the east, pushing their way through the bushes and branches. The white smoke that they sometimes saw kept on reminding them of the possible future they dreaded. Astrid, are you all right? Please, don't worry about me. I can still walk. Or so he said, but he was most likely solely relying on his determination and will to walk. Their progress was slow. Letty was still nursing an injured leg and Astrid was far from his best condition. We are still fine as of the moment. But what should I do if Astrid could no longer move? I do not have much strength either to carry him. If only, someone could help. If they encountered one of their attackers, she would force one of them to her orders. She was now starting to doubt if her decision before was truly correct. What was that? The duo stopped on their tracks when they heard the sound. They slowly walked to it to take a closer look. Oscar? Astrid was surprised when he heard Letty. An unconscious Oscar was lying on the ground. His coat was dirty. Near him were some stones that clearly came from a landslide. He probably fell down from there. Oscar saved us this time. I surmise he was running desperately that he did not pay attention to where he was going. He was probably running away from a fire ahead of us. They could either return up to the main road or take a longer detour. Since they were already on their way downhill, taking the longer detour and heading eastward would be easier for their injured bodies as compared to the tedious climb up to the main road. Letty had decided to go eastward and leave Oscar behind. However, a second glance at the unconscious former doctor caused hesitation. She scolded herself for it then urged herself to go. Astrid looked at Letty and then turned to Oscar. Are we leaving him, your highness? He is after my life. I cannot risk that danger. Astrid was already reaching his limit. He could lose his life. But I don't want to. If it were not for me, your highness would have saved him. No, I will not. Leaving him here is the right decision. Astrid firmly but calmly objected. Yes, your highness will. I know your kind heart would have not allowed it. I remember how you even worried about our attackers if they had gone down the mountain safely. Letty searched her memory when she had said those words, but could not find it. I heard your highness murmur about it. So you see, worrying about others is a part of your highness's nature that you don't remember them at all. Astrid smiled at Letty's confusion. Whenever your highness worries about others so naturally, I'm always reminded that I am broken, that I am missing something essential in being a normal person. I felt the same yesterday. I finally realized I was wrong after seeing your highness. Letty had the same thoughts about Astrid. She sometimes felt that she and Astrid were different in essentials. Letty could not believe then that killing, taking lives just to stop someone, was such a natural thought for the boy. But despite that, I still want to be like your highness. I want to be someone who would help people simply because it is the right thing to do. Astrid's true self was lying somewhere inside a deep, deep darkness. 
and yet, he was still reaching out his hands toward the light. Please, allow me this chance to be that kind of person. Letty could not understand why Astrid wanted to be so upright. But for whatever reason, Astrid was not giving up on his battle to be his ideal self. His unwavering determination made him blindingly bright to Letty. She wished to see how he would grow. We are both aspiring for something, thought Letty. Then this was not the place for them to give up. They needed to survive this ordeal. Not just Letty or just Astrid alone, they need to see through this together. I understand. We will help Oscar. Thank you, your highness. She was the one who wanted to thank him. Letty's wish was granted because she allowed Astrid's request. She scolded herself that she should not depend on someone younger, but decided to let this one go. He did proclaim himself 18 years old, after all. Since we are going to save him now, why not threaten him and have him look at your wound? They needed a doctor and they happened to meet one even before they reached Mount Gran. They would be fools to let this chance go to waste. But Astrid did not agree. I am fine, your highness. I just lost too much blood. I took some medicine from the attacker's things. I doubt there is anything much a doctor could do, explained Astrid. We should also keep my injury a secret from him. It will keep him in check. But, protested Letty. I was an assassin, your highness. I know when a wound is severe enough to kill. I am fine. Letty looked straight at Astrid, gauging the truth in his words. In the end, she gave in with a sigh. Very well then, if you say so. And since you seem to have some energy left, why don't we put up a little play for our new friend? Oscar was slowly regaining his consciousness as he heard someone repeatedly calling his name. Someone grabbed his shoulders and was woken up by a sharp pain on his cheek. Oh, you have awoken. Good day. How are you feeling? He slowly opened his eyes and saw Princess Letitia in front of him. He remembered how they found traces of someone climbing up the mountain and Her Highness's ribbon there. He knew that she was alive, but he did not know why she would be here. But he did not ponder long on it. This was the perfect chance for him. She survived and ended up finding me here. She thinks I am here to save her. Unfortunately, she ended up saving the man who would kill her. He felt sorry for her, but he had to do it for the sake of his king, Prince Friedhelm. Your Highness, are you all right? Do you have any wounds? Worriedly asked Oscar as he looked at his surroundings. Letty was unarmed and alone. He could accomplish this mission easily. He readied himself and placed his hand at the hilt of his sword when he felt a sharp object pressed at his back and a threatening presence behind him. Fear seized him. He used to live on a battlefield. His instincts screamed at him. I will be killed. He could not even move a muscle. The strong scent of death pervaded his senses. Don't move. At the count of three tell me your organization, a cold voice said. Oh, that was wrong. If you dare move, you'll be dead. You are truly used to saying those lines, are you not, Astrid? Oscar saw that Letty was not even surprised at his action. He could even say she was expecting it. Did she already notice that the Lowenstein were behind this? Was that the reason why she asked Astrid to sneak up at him? Oscar regretted his thoughtlessness. The moment he held his sword was like confessing he was the spy. Letty, however, did not even touch on that topic and instead asked him what he thought was a random question. Oscar, do you want to live? Oscar did not understand for a moment what she asked him, but soon recovered and had his own interpretation. If I do, should I comply with your highness's order? No. I only wanted to know. Do you want to live? Letty sighed as she saw Oscar unsure how to answer her. You encountered a wildfire ahead and ran away to escape from it. We are also in the same predicament. Therefore, I propose a truce between us until we reach the foot of the mountain. A truce? If you still want to live, you can forge an alliance with us, your enemies, for the time being. Oscar silently considered Letty's offer. It was not a bad one. He could go down with them. He would be close to his main target and he could use any opportunity that may come since Astrid might let his guard down while they were on the move. Your face betrays your thoughts, commented Letty. I suggest you cooperate if you do not want to end up like your friends. What did you do? asked Oscar. They thought a monster went after them. I'm sorry for being a monster. Oscar was aware of Astrid's reputation. He knew he was among the best in the order despite being so young. And with him pressing a blade at his back speaking at such an icy tone, his words did not sound like a threat. It sounded like they were the truth. Anyway, you do not seem to be in a hurry to die, so come along. Astrid agreed. Please walk ahead, ordered Astrid to Oscar as he pushed the knife at the doctor. Oscar unconsciously looked behind. Astrid looked at him with an expression he used to show in the past. For Oscar, it was indeed the face of a monster. What are you doing, called Letty. We have to go. Oscar, terrified for his life, walked after Letty. Letty looked at him with exasperation. He should not be asking something so obvious. Astrid's reply also sounded like that. 
but I am. I have survived without any injuries. Oscar became silent again. Letty felt him sink into his own thoughts. She silently let out a sigh of relief. Our little plan worked. Letty took the lead because of two reasons. One was to prevent Oscar from noticing Astrid's injuries. He could easily find out about it if Astrid walked in front of him. If he thought that Letty was the one injured and Astrid was completely fine, he would be more careful about his actions. The other reason was to keep him distracted. This was the reason why she kept him engaged in conversation as they walked. You were once a white doctor, were you not? Why did you quit? For personal reasons. Nothing new. I was somehow expecting something with metal, like you wanted to curse the world out of utter disappointment in it. Oscar was rendered speechless. Letty was surprised at his reaction. She was just toying with him, but it seemed her little guess was close to the truth. The White Doctors are a group of medical practitioners who go around the world treating anyone in the battlefield regardless if they were soldiers or civilians. They are well known for carrying white flags to their missions so no one would attack them. What would it be like to live in such conditions, tending to the wounded day by day, encountering death on a daily basis? It is no wonder he would be hopeless upon witnessing this kind of reality every day. I do not like bringing up old wounds. He seemed to have entered his own world, so that would suffice for now. Now, the trio walked in silence. Letty's words brought Oscar's memories to the forefront of his mind. He remembered well the nothingness he felt during that time. No matter how much they, the white doctors, worked all day, the ugly truth would not go away. They would achieve nothing. Wars would not stop. People would continue dying or being killed mercilessly. He already lost all hope in the world and then he met Prince Friedhelm. Would you like to be a knight? You could try protecting people even before they get wounded, suggested Friedhelm. Oscar accepted Friedhelm's invitation and became one of the prince's knights. As he learned more about this young man, he started thinking and believing that, maybe, Friedhelm can create a world free of war. This was the reason why he agreed to do this mission. For his master to be the king, Crown Princess Letitia was in his way. He had to eliminate all that could stop Friedhelm from making his ideal come true. Now, that one big hindrance was walking in front of him. She was vulnerable facing her back to him. Oscar was observing Letty's movements ever since they started their flight from the wildfire. He could see her looking at the shadows and then stop for a while to write something in the air with her fingers. After that, she would decide the direction they go. Don't tell me her highness is not just an ordinary princess. There's no way she knows about that, thought Oscar. That meant navigation using the sun and the shadows cast by the trees. If one knows the length of their strides, then approximating the distance traveled based on the number of steps made would be easy. Use this information and draw the path in the map stored in the mind and this could locate their place and decide which way to go. Such knowledge is commonly taught for princes to be useful when reading maps and making strategies or simply hearing them out. But Letty is a princess. Princesses are supposed to wait for their families to return safely to the castle. No one would bother to teach her how to read maps. She would not even come to consider this. So why did she? Did she already know she would be a queen? Oscar shivered at the thought. He initially thought Astrid was a monster, but Letty might be one as well. We are heading for a cliff if we continue in this direction. We have to walk around a little more and, Letty stopped mid-sentence and then cried, Astrid. Letty was turning around when she saw Astrid kneeling down and rushed towards him. Pull yourself together, Astrid. Here, lean on me. I am all right, your highness. I was just a little dizzy. All right means you have the strength to walk alone, and you are clearly not that. Just follow me, ordered Letty. Oscar was silent. It took him a moment to comprehend the scene unfolding in front of him. Letty did not know that Oscar was still confused, so she suddenly regretted her hasty action. She was at a loss on what she should do if Oscar found this to be the perfect opportunity for him. But unexpected things were bound to happen. A strong, hot wind blew at them. Letty staggered to keep her balance since she was supporting Astrid. They knew exactly what news this wind brought. Heat wave, muttered Letty. Has it reached here as well, wondered Oscar. This wind only meant one thing. Wildfire had spread even at Mount Stein and it would continue on doing so. The mountain was full of dried leaves and branches, perfect fuel for a raging fire. The wind blew once again. Letty raised her arm to protect her eyes from the dust being blown up by the wind. She looked up and saw sunset-colored snow falling down from the gray skies. Sparks. Sparks were flying everywhere. Fire, shouted Oscar. Letty turned and saw a small fire starting to burn the dried leaves. The crackling sound it created could be clearly heard in the stillness of the forest. There was no going back now. They had to run away from the fire and get down the mountain. Oscar, listen. There was no time for her to hesitate. She would have to believe Oscar's past beliefs and his loyalty to Friedhelm. Prince Friedhelm wished to have Astrid as his knight. I know he will be a remarkable knight and be Friedhelm's pride. Please, save him. 
Escaping the wildfire while walking as she supported Astrid was impossible. They would not be fast enough. To save him, Letty needed Oscar's cooperation. Helping Astrid is for Friedhelm's sake, pleaded Letty. I know you understand that. Save him. He is not connected to all this. Oscar shook his head at Letty's cry. I will do no such thing. No matter how you look at it, he is your highness's dog. It's as clear as daylight that he would never be his highness's knight. Or did you think you could move me by appealing to my heart as a doctor, snorted Oscar. Letty carefully supported Astrid to sit down on the ground. She took a few steps to face Oscar. Are you stupid, shouted Letty as she slapped Oscar's left check with all her might. Are you an idiot? Do you think that you should save people only because you are a doctor? Do you not help people because you are one as well? Are doctors the only ones who can save lives? To help is a part of human nature. Doctors are not the only ones tasked to do it. Letty's words silenced Oscar. It brought him down to his past, making him remember something essential he had forgotten. Astrid wanted to save you when we saw you lying unconscious on the ground. He wanted to do what a normal human would. Answer that feeling in the same manner as a fellow human. Light slowly returned to Oscar's dead eyes. But no matter what I do, the world will never change. People will still die. Is there even any meaning in helping as a doctor? As another human? Letty had no plans on touching the despair Oscar was carrying inside him. That was Oscar's problem alone. She could only pray for his future. I pity you, said Letty. Oscar asked why. Is a person like me pitiable? Yes. I am not that strong. I may find myself hopeless and curse the world why things turned out this way. A monarch carries everything. Letty was not confident she could bear the weight of it all. But she was certain of one thing. She was not alone. I have Astrid. As long as he is here, I will always remember the feeling I felt when I decided to be who I want to be when I see how honest Astrid was trying to live his life. Whenever she feels like crying or when she stumbles, if Astrid is by her side, in his blinding light and constancy like the Polaris, she could gain back her strength and motivation to stand up once again. Letty had decided to make Astrid her knight at that point. I pity you for not having that kind of person beside you. Beside me? Humans are naturally weak. There would always be a time when you need to hold on to something. I pray you will find that in the future. Then, started Oscar as he approached Letty, give me something to hold on to. Grant me the light that would never fade and continue on shining within the darkness of despair and hopelessness. Oscar knew he was asking for the absurd. There was no way anyone could prepare an anchor for someone who asked so suddenly. But Letty nodded her acceptance. Then let me vow to you that Solvel will never wage, not even a single war in my reign. Not a single war? Whenever you feel despair as you helplessly send off the dead somewhere, think of this, no one in the kingdom of Solvel is suffering such death. That somewhere in the world, there is a place where the services of the white doctors are not needed. Letty offered Salvel's existence to be something he could hold on to. Are you saying you can accomplish that? Yes, I can. The Belden region of North Ruth was burned. You do understand what that means for them, do you not? Without their food source, deaths due to starvation were inevitable for the coming winter. When that happens, even the white doctors could not do anything. I was able to push forth this large-scale aid for North Ruth to help them survive the winter. Not one shall die because of empty stomachs. Letty was on her way to Mount Grant to tell them that. Your Highness, have you ever been called to be too kind-hearted? Your master had told me once that the best way to describe me was a kind-hearted princess. Those words also meant that he thinks she was not fit for the throne. Letty knew that and kept on admonishing herself for her actions. She kept on reminding herself to be the praiseworthy queen she wanted to be. I know I am not in a position to say this, but, please your highness, hurry up and complete your knights of the round. At this rate, no matter how many lives you possess, they would never be enough, joked Oscar. And I never thought I would hear those words from you. Oscar took out the sword hanging from his waist and threw it far away. A sword is far too heavy for a doctor. I will carry Astrid. Can you walk alone, your highness? Yes. Thank you. Letty, Oscar with Astrid on his back, raced down the mountain to escape the spreading wildfire. Letty took the lead and guided Oscar which way to go. They just ran and ran until their feet ached. They did not even have the time to complain about it. The smoke was getting thicker and thicker. Sparks were flying everywhere. The fire was gaining momentum. The sparks would sometimes burn their clothes or their hair, surrounding them with that particular burnt smell, and it was disconcerting to say the least. Smell? Thought Letty. Something about the smell caught her attention as she was wiping her mouth with her sleeve. She took a deep breath and felt something bitter in her tongue and her throat. But there was something different. She inhaled again. The density of the smoke was different. It was lighter. The heat wave billowed following the undulations of the mountain. Sometimes, the wind was so strong that they could hardly stay upright. 
At times, it was just a gentle breeze. The difference in the wind meant the amount of smoke it carried was also different. If only I could feel the flow of the wind, wished Letty and then suddenly realized that she indeed could accomplish such a feat she was certain she had the ability in her. The sword of gale winds was inside her. Feeling the wind should be just a breeze. Concentrate, Letty told herself. She may not be able to call a cold wind up beyond the clouds, but she probably could clearly feel the wind around her. She was practicing every single day to use the sword of gale winds since she started her journey back to the capital. Her ability to read the winds had improved immensely. Feel it, commanded Letty to herself and soon her senses changed. Do not feel the wind with your skin alone. Feel it with your whole being. She could slowly feel the wind through her sense of touch, hearing, smell, and finally, her vision. Colors started to fill Letty's eyes. The green of the forest, the white smoke, the red sunset, and then another color painted her surroundings, the color of the wind. It was a sudden enlightenment. She could not explain how it happened. The only thing she was sure of was that she could go anywhere as long as she could see the wind. Strengthen the power in you, Letty. The princess with the other two men behind her ran according to the flow of the wind where there was no trace of smoke coming in. The more Letty concentrated, the clearer she saw the road of the wind. A wind map was drawn right in front of her eyes and Letty just continued on following the path drawn for her. Now that she was seeing it, she could not remember how the world looked like without it. It was a strange sensation, and yet it felt like it was how her vision should be. Here, Letty called to Oscar. Just a bit more. Believe. We are going the right way, Letty told herself. The smoke she was inhaling was getting lighter and lighter. The clear wind was getting bigger and wider. We made it, cried Letty. At last, their chests were filled with clean and fresh air. A few steps in front of them was a landscape of vivid green fields and blue skies. They were now safe from the red fire and gray smoke. Relief filled the three of them. They were joyous and grateful for this miracle. They wanted to live, so they fought their way out of that precarious situation and they succeeded in their escape. In their hands, now, was their future. We're alive, breathed Oscar in disbelief. Letty savored the clean, but dry, air and nodded satisfactorily for their escape. Yes, we are alive. This is one unforgettable moment in my life. It taught me how wonderful the things we take for granted are. We should at least thank God for this. Thank. Which is Prince Friedhelm for you, continued Letty. Friedhelm's private chivalric order, the seventh heaven is also known as the cult of the firm believers of Friedhelm. Guido's Valkyrie was a lot more normal being composed of true knights as compared to Friedhelm's little following. We should continue downhill and search for a safe place. A clearing without much burnable materials will be for the best, suggested Oscar. Oscar was right. They may be out of the range of fire for now, but they were still in the mountain and therefore still within the range of the fire. Letty searched for a way downhill as she consulted both the wind map and the map of the land she had in her mind. They all walked down slowly and carefully from the mountain. After they have safely descended from Mount Stein, Letty once again checked their current location. Since they prioritized their safety, they ended up going far from the road leading to the north foot of Mount Gran. We are, asked Oscar who was just following Letty as he carried Astrid on his back. Letty pointed out north. We are currently at the border of Mount Gran and Mount Stein. Right ahead of us is north. If we go east, we shall reach Mount Gran and to go west means climbing up Mount Stein. They were heading for the evacuation area set up by North Ruth at the north foot of Mount Gran. However, for their safety, they would need to head west first to go to the main road. Can Duke North Ruth see all this smoke on Mount Stein from where he is? Would he just dismiss this as smoke from Mount Grand being blown by the wind? If that happens, they would all be in big trouble. They have to inform Duke North Ruth about the fire at Mount Stein and the sparks it brings with it. They should close off the main road and tell the travelers to take the longer route or else their lives would be in danger. Is this really enough? Should I just continue to head to the evacuation site and report that the fire is spreading faster than we had expected?" asked Letty to herself. After that, they would lead another evacuation to keep the people safe. Right now, that was the only thing Letty thought she could do. Your Highness, we should hurry. Yes, indeed. We should also inform Duke Northruth that Mount Stein's road is burnt down. Letty closed her eyes to feel once again the wind. She checked if there was any fire ahead of them. And then she noticed a peculiar wind. A wind passing through the mountain? Was there a tunnel in Mount Gran or Mount Stein? She knew none that was big enough to let a noticeable amount of wind through it. Then how? Mount Gran was once a mine, remembered Letty as Alexander told her about this information before. The magical stone Arinarung was once mined from Mount Gran during the mythical times. This was also the reason why Lion King Alexander and Administrative King Karl Heinz declared Mount Gran to be Salvel's territory. They wanted to keep the mountain under their watch just in case. There are countless holes on the mountain and no one knows what was there. Letty noticed something strange about that wind passing through the mountain. It is wet, murmured Letty. 
a mine, a tunnel, and wet wind coming out of the mountain. What could all this mean? A large reservoir of stagnant water. Letty may not be able to call two kinds of winds to create rain clouds. But maybe, she could heat up the water on land, raise it up to the sky to become clouds. Go ahead to the evacuation site, ordered Letty. I will stay here. I have something I should do. Your Highness, asked a surprised Oscar. You will carry Astrid as you go, so I understand your progress will be slow. Going to the site may take you a whole day on foot. That would be too late. Letty cracked her brain for another way to let the Mount Grand Party know about what she was about to do. One mistake and it could lead to a worse disaster. They have to lead the people to safety before he puts her plan into action. Your Highness, may we know what you are thinking, asked Astrid. The young lad asked the doctor to put him down. He had rested enough. I now understand how Senpai feels. Please, Your Highness. You do not have to do everything alone. I will also stay. But even if you do, you could do, started Letty but stopped. She was about to say nothing when she suddenly came up with an idea. She could send a message to Mount Grand where Duke was using the sword of white light Astrid possessed. Are you certain you are all right, Astrid? Yes, Your Highness. I was only a little dizzy because of losing too much blood. I will do my best not to be a burden. He could fulfill Letty's request even while seated. So, despite knowing she was pushing Astrid to his limits, she asked for his help. Astrid, lend me your strength for a while longer. Once that is finished, go with Oscar and join Duke and the others. No, I will protect and stay by your highness's side till the end. I will not break my promise with Duke Senpai. Thank you, was all Letty could say. If not for Astrid, she could have not come this far. He had helped her a lot during this whole ordeal. Oscar, you can go ahead. Once you reach the site, tell the order to come and fetch Astrid. Letty was almost ordering Oscar on what he should do. She thought he might be willing to do as much. If not, she was going to threaten him to follow her. Oscar, however, surprised Letty with his answer. Or maybe, this was who Oscar really was. I will not leave a wounded patient alone and go ahead. As a doctor, I cannot do that. I will stay here and do everything I could to prevent his wound from getting any worse. Huh? Weren't you a former doctor, Astrid wondered aloud. Astrid was the one who took initiative to help Oscar. And yet his insensitivity to the mood of the situation, or perhaps it was his naivety could be considered as a talent already, was Letty's exasperated thought. Being a knight did not suit me. I am better at curing wounds than brandishing swords. I have realized now that I have no talent for that, said Oscar. Letty did not know what brought forth this change of heart in Oscar. But maybe, Oscar just took a detour. Now that he had thrown away his sword, he had finally made up his mind to go back to his own path. He may be disappointed in reality right now that he could not see his own worth, but someday, he will see what gift and blessing it is to be a skilled doctor. Your Highness, what should I do? asked Astrid. Astrid's question brought Letty's mind back to Mount Gran. Go somewhere clear of any obstructions and you can see the evacuation site. I want you to relay a message through our light code. What will it be? Rain will pour on Mount Gran tonight, declared Letty as she pointed to the summit of Mount Gran. I cannot say how strong the rain will be. A worse calamity may happen because of the rain, so I want the people to move out. Astrid nodded at Letty's words. He believes that if Letty said rain would pour on Mount Gran, then rain it shall. But Oscar was different. He could not believe how rain clouds would gather around Mount Gran with the heat wave pervading in the area. How? We can make it rain as long as the necessary conditions are met. Letty's power alone is not enough to call forth a cold wind in the highest part of the sky. But that was not the only way to make it rain. She could use this large supply of stagnant water as a component for making rain. Letty suddenly remembered what one-armed King Oswald said before about her in the Night King's study. The day will come for you to use that power. The king in the future of Letty probably read about this heat wave incident and the succeeding rain that poured on Mount Grand written in the annals of Salvel. He would then realize that Letty had used the Night King's power to make it rain. If this were true, then Letty would succeed in her plan. The words of her descendant from the future gave her confidence. Chapter 4 the rain at night. This is the Night King's study. The carpet lining the floor is designed with the tails of the gods bordered with golden ears of grains. At the ceiling is a grand wooden chandelier. On the carpet was an elegant patina table made of evergreen oak partnered with chairs that have backboards worthy to be called pieces of art. There were already four other kings present in the room when Letty visited. She greeted them with the perfunctory greetings and went straight to her topic. Tell me the location of the tunnel in Mount Gran. I have to get there immediately. Letty came to the Night King's study with a purpose. She wanted to know the entrance to the old mine in Mount Gran, but it was not written on any map she knew. She knew about Mount Gran being a mine in the olden times, but it was a long time ago so she might miss the entrance to it even though it was right in front of her since time could have erased it. Where are you now? asked Lion King Alexander. 
Alexander was the first of the four to respond to Letty's query. Letty went near the seat of the proud king, slouching on his chair. She drew a simple map of the area, with her finger in the air. Alexander looked at the map Letty drew and pointed at one point. Administrative King Karl Heinz lifted his head up from the book he was reading to share his knowledge as well. That is the mine for the Arinarung. I wanted to see it myself so I went there once. Use the Sword of Grand Earth upon reaching that point King Alexander pointed out. You can sense the part where the rock wall is thinner compared to the other parts. That is where the old entrance is. Letty thanked Karl Heinz for his advice. If you will be using much power, I think it will be better if there are no other promise swords around. Your power would be attracted to it making it difficult to concentrate, added one-armed King Oswald. Oswald was a king living in a time of war. He was well versed in using the powers of the Night King. His advice would surely be useful. I did not know that. Thank you for telling me. Lastly, Letty addressed Gunshot King Ledger. Is the rain produced by our powers different from a normal rain? Nope, I think it is the same. Are you afraid to make it rain, Queen Letitia? Letty asked herself after Ledger asked. She was afraid of losing control of her powers and causing more hardship to the people because of the devastating rain she would create. In that sense, yes, she was indeed afraid. Don't worry. It's not scary. You'll feel ecstatic at first. I did this. Look at it, shared Ledger. He was the king who made rain by will. He was telling Letty of how he felt when he made it rain for the first time. And then when that ecstasy fades, fear will creep in. But it's not because of the rain. It's you. You'll fear yourself who made the rain. You'll feel it soon enough, Queen Letitia. The fear of having no god despite possessing godly powers yourself. Ledger stared into her with his clouded amber eyes. He was starting to act strangely. After you accomplish the rain, come here again. We'll be partners from now on. Ledger stood up and grabbed Letty's arm. He smelt of rain. He smelled the same last time, of rain, smoke, and another scent I cannot place. What an annoying brat, complained Alexander as he went to stand in between Ledger and Letty to protect the latter from seeing the maddened face of the former. Don't vent your irritation on women, kid. Me? Irritated? You reek of blood more than I do. You cannot wash away with rain the scent that had seeped in you. Just how many did you kill, calmly asked Alexander. However, it sounded like a challenge for Ledger. The normally depressed broken-hearted king poking fun at the other kings was now blinded with rage. He grabbed Alexander's clothes. Shut up. I'm not like you. A dull sound together with Ledger's scream echoed across the room. Alexander was blocking her vision so she could only imagine what happened and asked, what is happening? You go back and do what you have to do. I'll deal with this kid, said Alexander. Letty was about to protest, but her words no longer reached Alexander. Part 2 the tri-party session at the north foot of Mount Grand was still nowhere near its conclusion because Salvel's chief in command for this particular issue was yet to arrive. Craig continued on idly evading the topic, disregarding Duke Northworth's pressure to hurry things up. I care not a whit about your knights of whatnots, complicatedly jumbled system. I'm tired of hearing you say that you cannot do anything without the order from above. Please pardon me. I have never been under a country that could run well without a detailed classification in her military ranks. I somehow now envy such countries because they could immediately implement ordinances with just the command of their commander-in-chief and no formal proposals. Are you saying that my North Ruth is a small country? I think it is about the size of the earldom of Orlandie of Salvel. Its land is indeed big enough to be considered as a country. I have to say that my definition of big may be different from the rest. The earldom of North Ruth, oh, I meant the dukedom of North Ruth is big enough to be a country. Please pardon my mistake. Duke North Ruth and Craig were having their idle talk while they were working outside. Craig was tired of being cooped up inside the house so he forced Duke Northruth and Valerie to go outside and continue their meeting while they helped with the work on the site. You shitty old man. You purposely called my country an earldom. You're just like your master. This conversation ain't going anywhere. I've had enough talking to you. Bring out Duke, shouted Duke Northruth as he cut out the frayed end of the rope with a small knife he had in hand. Craig tied a strong knot with the rope, pulled it to check its strength, and replied to the duke, unfortunately, that youngster is still inexperienced to speak in this kind of situation. I am afraid your grace would have to tolerate this shitty old man for the time being. But I don't want to tolerate you. And what exactly were you thinking dragging us out here, because we are free? Well, the buffer zone is finished and we have a lot of wood from the cut trees. So I thought, why not make use of those, and make preparations in case anything unexpected happens? Take this little advice from this shitty old man. There were many evacuees and the little village here cannot accommodate all of them. Many were lying outside with just a cloth laid out on the ground. Craig suggested creating some beds to lay down on from the cut trees for the sick and severely injured. They were first making the base and then if there were still some trees left, 
they would put up pillars and tie for corners of cloth to create a makeshift tent to protect the patient from the falling ashes. Arg, groaned Duke Northruth. Don't take the insult personally. I'm certain those younger knights call you that way behind your back. Get used to it. Go and say it too, Valerie. I am sorry, but I was not able to catch the word. Could you please translate it to me? It was an insult. It means shitty old man in Kiev. Oh, I see. Salvelli is quite a refined language. Just how bad are the insults in Kiev? August Karls and Northruth, though seemingly rough in his language, was raised as a prince, while the principles of knighthood were embedded in Craig Bard. Valery Kiryakov, on the other hand, was a commoner and military man at heart. He cares nothing about the principles of knighthood or manners of the noble blood. It was natural for him to know more vulgar language compared to the other two men of noble birth. However, since he was speaking with his learned Salvelli, his speech sounded polished. The three men may sound like they were busy exchanging jabs at each other, but their hands were also busy doing their work. None of them could stay still at the present situation. Lord August. There's light coming from Mount Stein. The three men stopped whatever they were doing under the dimly moonlit sky and followed the North Ruth soldier to the clearing where they said to have seen the light. Is that a light from a lamp? But is it not too bright, commented Valerie. Indeed, the light was too strong to come from a traveler's lamp. Everyone was creeped out by the unnatural light. What was it? Damn it. That ain't a ghost, right? Oh, exclaimed Craig. I remember your grace is afraid of ghosts. Fortunately, that light is not ghostly, for I believe a human is behind it. The light was blinking at certain intervals. Duke was the first one to notice what the blinking light meant. He came to the clearing as well when a fellow knight of the order called him. It's the order's light code. Quick. Someone bring something to write with. The light blinks following several patterns, each representing a letter. Duke asked for writing materials, but he did not need them to decode the message. The light stopped and then resumed blinking again. Your Highness, murmured Duke upon reading the beginning of the message. Duke? It's from Her Highness. It started with the word we have set to include in our messages for me to know it is from her. Letty was alive and she was trying to convey a message to them. Craig was also decoding the message as it blinked. He could not hide his surprise upon finishing it. Rain will pour on Mount Gran. What did you say, cried Duke Northruth. Is there anything else? Cannot predict how much rain. Move out. Are you certain that this message is from Princess Letitia? Duke assured him it was. Everyone, shouted Duke Northruth. We are re-evacuating according to plan. Move it. Northruth's soldiers moved immediately upon the Duke's command. Kielf Empire's General Valerie, however, said he could not believe it to happen. There is not even a trace of rain cloud around Mount Gran. How could it possibly rain? If Princess Letitia said so, then it will. The first person to profess their complete faith to Letty was not Duke nor Craig, but Duke Northruth. She is an intelligent woman, intelligent enough to stand beside me. Her only fault is that she does not extol my praises. Other than that, I can declare her perfect. Duke thought Duke Northruth was steering out of the topic, but the Silver Wolf Duke soon returned it on track. And do you think that Princess Letty will give us false information? No, I don't think so. She was the one who took the initiative to have the decision first in order to help the people immediately. She truly grieved the situation. And she promised me. There's no reason to doubt her. The two knights of the said princess looked at each other upon hearing Duke Northruth's honest opinion about their master. She seemed to be unusually trusted by the Duke. You should go and help too. That's what she wishes, isn't it, ordered Duke Northruth as we quickly moved out and left a surprised Duke and Craig. Now, where have I heard that before, pondered Craig as started to walk out as well. Which, Vice Commander, asked Duke as he followed the senior knight. The only fault of Her Highness is that she does not extol His Grace's praises. Craig searched his memory and soon found another situation where he heard such an expression. Ah, Her Highness said before that the only fault of His Grace is that he does not extol her praises. Her Highness and His Grace are similar, aren't they? Maybe there is something that only people carrying the weight of the country on their backs could understand. Maybe Letty and Duke Northruth understand each other more than they thought. Duke understood they were standing somewhere they, her mere knights, cannot enter and the thought made him envy the Duke a little. I wonder if they received Her Highness's message, said Astrid. Who knows? If the code Her Highness left was correct, they would, replied Oscar. Letty thought of sending a message to the evacuation site with the help of light. They used the light code of the Royal Chivalric Order for their night communications. Here, bite this. It will not help much, but it can ease the pain a little, said Oscar as he offered Astrid some leaves. The young knight followed the doctor. Uh, they're bitter. Oscar said they would ease the pain, but he thought all those leaves did was to distract him from the pain because of its extreme bitterness. Astrid was enduring the bitter leaves when Oscar asked him a question. How did you make that lamp shine so brightly? 
Did you learn some techniques in the order to do that? The lamp Oscar referred to was the lamp he lent Astrid to use to send the light code. Its light was just enough to illuminate the small area around it so it was impossible to reach that far, much more to the other mountain. But when Astrid held the lamp, it shone so bright, it was almost blinding. The reason for the strong glow was the power of the sword of white light that Letty granted to him. But, of course, Astrid was not that stupid to tell him that. Well, we were taught not to leak information, came Astrid's obvious excuse. Oscar knew Astrid was not telling everything, but Oscar accepted his answer, thinking it could truly be classified information of the order. The two men silently stared at the now flickering light of the lamp. After a while, Oscar broke the silence. Will not go? Go after her highness? She told me I would only be a distraction. So I will just stay here and guard the perimeter. Besides, her highness is strong, so strong that having someone beside her for her protection would just be a burden for her. Letty jumped down the bridge to save Astrid. Letty protected Astrid with her own body so that he would not be injured. There were so many instances that Letty could have come out unscathed if she were alone. But you want to protect her. Yes, I want her highness to rely on me and be of use to her. I want to stay by her side. But on this trip, Astrid thought the only thing he accomplished was to disappoint Letty. He wanted to protect her completely and return her safely to Duke, instead, he caused her injuries. Letty told him they might die, so they should tell each other their last words. At that time, Astrid told her of his desire to be her knight. But maybe, he was not even qualified to say that. Being what you want to be is hard. Oscar nodded in agreement at Astrid's words. At times, you thought you have become who you wanted, but in the end, it was all in your head and you really are not, commented Oscar as if telling it to himself. That evening, Letty headed to Mount Gran alone after giving instructions to Astrid and Oscar. By the time the sun had set completely, she finally reached the entrance to the mine Alexander taught her. Next, she searched for the closed entrance using the Sword of Great Earth just as Karl Heinz told her. When she found it, she used the same sword to break into the stone blocking the entrance. Letty took a deep breath and steeled her resolve as she took the first step inside the mine. I cannot see the wind flow here, but I am certain it is connected above ground. As she went deeper in the darkness, Letty noticed the scent of water. She continued walking on without any hesitation. Inside the mine was a world of darkness and silence. A normal person could not possibly bear the seeming nothingness, but Letty had night vision thanks to the Sword of Black Darkness. Besides, she could also feel the flow of the wind due to the Sword of Gale winds. There is color, sound, and wind here. It is not scary at all. After walking for some time, Letty heard something. The sound of water, she muttered. The sound of dropping water into a pool echoed inside the tunnel. She knew not how much she had walked until she felt something cold touch her boots. She finally reached the water. Letty did not stop walking. She continued until the level of the water reached her knees. She kneeled down and submerged her hands into the water. Come, sword of hellfire. The sword immediately appeared in her hand. She pierced the sword into the earth. Yes, I can feel it. There are other tunnels connecting to the surface. Letty ordered flames to come out of the sword. It heated the water, and just as she hoped, the hot water slowly started to moisten the air and moved upwards. She poured in more power to widen the range she was heating. After some time, water droplets from above started falling. Letty understood what she was doing was not enough. I am only heating up a part of the water. The air would cool down before it could get out of the tunnel, become water and fall again to the pool. It was not enough to create rain clouds outside of the mountain. Another power was needed aside from the heat provided by hellfire. She should use the water mirror in order to circulate the water as it was heated by the fire. After that, she needs to release the massive amount of humid air through all of the tunnels connected here. Unfortunately, she did not have that much power in her to accomplish everything. She needed to hold the sword of hellfire in one hand to heat the water and the sword of water mirror in the other to circulate it. Both swords needed her full concentration and power. However, using just one sword was already pushing the limits of her power. She was certain this was not a problem about control. This was what Ludger told her about before, about how much Night King power they possessed. Letty stared at the water and told herself, what should I do? Then she looked up as if someone called her. What she saw astounded her. Some parts of the wall, ceiling, and the ground underwater started to glow a green light. Beautiful, whispered Letty as she stood up and went closer to the shining spot. She paddled out the water as she walked. When she touched the glowing stone, something rang in her ear. The sound was clearer and more resounding than the sound of a bell. As she heard the sound, she felt power. Irinarung? The magical stone King Alexander told me about? The magical stone Irinarung came into contact with the Night King's power Letty possessed and resonated with it. The sound the stones released seemed to be calling out to the other stones and they started to answer the call. Soon the green glow started to spread like ripples in the water and Letty was the center of it, and then, gone. 
When Letty heard from Alexander that Mount Graham was an old mine for the magic stone Arinarung, she assumed that all of the stones were mined and nothing was left now. But the stones were here. The stones were not gone. They just lost the source of their powers when the gods disappeared from this land. Thus, the magical stones turned into normal stones and Mount Gran turned from being a valuable mountain to an ordinary mountain. Books and old writings containing this truth were probably lost due to the book burnings that ensued during the course of history. This left them in the dark as to why they were fighting over Mount Gran. In the darkness, Letty cried out, Please lend me your powers. The Arinarung stones might respond once again to the power she possessed and show the power they once had. If she would be able to use the Swords of Promise at the same time with the help of these stones slumbering in the mountain, then it only meant one thing. Rain will pour on Mount Grand tonight. Letty knew she had to do this. She gathered the Night King's power into her hands. Some stones were already responding to her power. She placed her hand on one of the glowing parts, took a deep breath, and sent more power to her hand. Send all of this water up to the sky. The Sword of Hellfire slowly heated up the water. The Sword of Water Mirror circulated the water at the same time. The Arinarung stones started to respond to Letty's powers. This began a chain reaction to the other stones and soon all of these stones in Mount Grand resonated with Letty, the sound of their power ringing in Letty's ears. The chime of the stones were so loud, it was almost noisy. However, the sound was of a magical nature, so even if Letty covered her ears, she would still hear it. Nonetheless, the desire to cover her ears was still there because it was too loud. And it was not just the sound. I have had enough of this heat. The hot humid air was starting to go out of the tunnel. Letty continued on pouring her powers despite being drenched wet from head to toe. She was no longer sure if the liquid dripping down her cheeks was her own sweat or from the evaporating water. The heat and wetness were uncomfortable, but Letty soon got used to it and her consciousness was starting to be drawn to the powers she felt in her hands. This is amazing. The Arinarung stones are resonating with each other so my power is transmitted easily. I may not see it, but I can clearly feel it. She could not help the smile from her lips, a smile from the exaltation she felt from using the Night King's power as she wished. You'll feel ecstatic at first, huh? She did not know whether feeling exactly what Ledger said was good or bad, but she was certain of one thing. This is much better than crying because I cannot do anything. The water originally reached up to her hips. It was now only around her ankle. But Letty did not stop there. She walked in further to the deeper part of the pool. I will make rain clouds enough to cover the area around this mountain. I need more. Astrid and Oscar were going back to the boundary of Mount Gran and Mount Stein were the separated ways with Letty. On their way, they noticed the change in the air at the same time. Humid air was coming down from the mountain at extreme speed. Rain will fall soon if this continues, without a doubt. Oscar knew not what Letty did, but he was certain she would succeed in making it rain. A chill crawled down his spine, not because of the sudden cold, but because of the joy he felt for the miracle that was about to happen. Mount Gran was in the same state as Oscar. Everyone noticed the change at the same time. The wind coming from the mountain turned from hot and dry to wet. Rain is coming. Hurry up the preparations. Everyone rushed with the preparations to move out. Each movement was filled with gladness. This annoyingly humid air meant rain, the rain they were desperately hoping for and soon it would pour down into this dry land. Have you finished the roll call? How about the list of evacuees? Make sure the children stay with their parents, ordered Duke, Salvel's operations commander, after receiving the reports. Thanks to the contingency plan of evacuation in case of rain the Tri-Party Conference prepared, they were able to move out in an orderly fashion. Vice Commander, all of the evacuees have left. Roll call for Salvel was also finished. Then let us go as well, though I do not mind savoring the rain here. The transfer they prepared in case of emergency was proceeding well. Duke gazed at Mount Gran and told himself that he already did enough. He could now leave the rest to the others. Vice Commander, I am sorry. I am willing to take punishment for leaving my post, Duke declared and ran away after saying his piece. On his way out, he met Guido's knight, Bruno, and called him. Bruno, sorry, but could you give that to the vice commander, shouted Duke as he threw something towards Bruno. He was soon on his horse and went off quickly. Bruno hurriedly caught whatever Duke threw and he slowly opened his hand to check what it was. Should I really give this to Sir Craig, whispered Bruno. What he caught was a badge of the Royal Chivalric Order. He was in the middle of considering whether to follow Duke's wishes or defy it, when Craig crept behind him and asked, is that a badge of the Order? Uh, well, hesitated Bruno. If he gave Duke's badge to Craig, then it meant Duke was quitting the Order. Indeed, Duke was meant to leave the order someday, but not this way. He was supposed to be sent off enviously by his colleagues for being a future member of the Knights of the Round. Craig solved Bruno's dilemma with a simple question, did Duke drop that? Craig's voice said it all. He understood everything and was more than willing to let Duke's infraction slide. This was the reason why he asked if Duke dropped his badge. Yes, sir, he dropped this. 
Could you please keep it for him? I will, agreed Craig and continued. Kids these days are so indecisive. His comment sounded like it was inexcusable. If he made the decision a moment later, I would have been the one to throw my badge away and go for Her Highness. I thought I couldn't do those things I used to when I was young, but I guess I still have it in me. Bruno gave a strained laugh at Craig's confession. It sounded real coming from Craig Bard, the man who threw away his future of being the first knight of the round. Bruno could not even hear it as a joke at all. The sound of water droplets hitting the ground filled the air. At first, they were scattered, irregular drops. Then, they soon turned into a strong rain as if someone from the heavens was pouring buckets of water to the earth. Letty closed her eyes and relished the sound. She succeeded. Rain was pouring down Mount Gran. The fires would be extinguished. The ground would be dampened and the wildfire could no longer spread. Her only worry now was the effects of the rain. All she could do was to believe in Duke Northruth. But I made this one huge misstep, breathed out Letty as she sat down on the ground, with water reaching her ankles and slowly rising. If it rains, the water that was originally here would return. I do not know how much water would flow back here, but it could be higher than me. She would have to stand up, move to a shallower part of the pool, and get out of the tunnel before that happens. The problem was Letty used up all of her energy that she could not even move a finger. There was no need for her to push herself to her limit, but she was pulled by the resonance of the stones so her control slipped later on. If I die here, it'd be a stupid death. And she did not want that, so she would still fight until the end. Letty stared at the rising water with determined eyes. She would stay still to regain her strength faster. By the time the water reached up to her hips, she might already have enough strength to move. With my body cooling down, my head is also starting to become clear. I only have one realization. I was utterly stupid. She jumped down a bridge to save Astrid without thinking of her position as the crown princess and ended up being heavily injured. Then, the succeeding actions she took to keep the support party safe, considering the worst-case situation ended up to be meaningless after Oscar informed them about what happened. And finally, this. She was carried away with the elation she felt in using her powers so she was now completely exhausted, her body submerged in water. I may catch a cold if I stay like this. I really am a fool. Being drenched in water made her remember that night when rain also poured and she was desperate as well. At that time. Your Highness. A shout reverberated in the tunnel. Letty let out a faint cry of surprise upon hearing the voice calling her. She was still in a state of disbelief, but she scolded her body and forced it to move even just her neck and mouth. Where are you? Are you further inside? She doubted Duke could hear her feeble, I'm here. Rain was pouring outside and the sound of water and his footsteps could easily drown her soft reply. But still, Duke did not let Letty's call fade into nothingness. He raised his lamp towards the direction where he heard Letty's voice and ran in search of her. Soon he found the tunnel and his master sitting in the middle of the pool, half of her body submerged in water. He ran to her. What's wrong? Are you hurt? Letty was not able to get out of the pool. It could only mean one thing, she was injured and that was why she could not move. No, I am not. I am just too exhausted to move. How about you? What are you doing here? Did you leave your post as the operations commander? The relocation site Duke Northruth prepared in case of rain was in the opposite direction from Mount Gran. If Duke was here, it was unlikely because he got lost. In other words, Duke came here on his own decision. No need to worry. I returned my badge to the vice commander. You quit. Why did you do that? Because I already have a new job waiting for me, a knight of the round. I know what I did was undeniably irresponsible, but I don't regret it one bit. Letty was speechless at Duke's declaration. He came here. He threw away everything to save her. He was a serious person, even to a fault. He always strived to accomplish every single task assigned to him. And yet, he threw away his duty and came here for her. Is that so, was Letty's initial reply, but that was not what she really wanted to say. She wanted to say this, I am happy you came here for me. Thank you. Duke embraced Letty the moment he heard those words. He embraced her so tightly, it was slightly hard to breathe. Maybe it was because of her exhausted expression that she made him worry too much. So Letty willed herself to move her arm. She gave him a weak embrace compared to his, but she supposed it was enough to tell him she was all right. You're warm. Of course I am. I am not a corpse. No, you are not. You are alive, really alive. I am. Duke's strained voice made Letty remember. Duke was at the evacuation site and received a report from the support party about her small chance of survival. And now Letty was in front of him, alive. He was probably feeling relieved from the hopelessness he felt upon hearing about her death. Because of that, Letty intentionally said a joke in a cheery voice. If we stay like this, we will look like a pair of lovers committing suicide together, won't we? Indeed. Can you move now? Absolutely not. 
sorry, but you have to carry me. Astrid was able to carry her on his back. She would be a whole lot easier to carry for Duke. We are a bit far from the entrance, so I need you to work hard. Letty let Duke carry her on his back. She leaned on him completely. An exhausted person's body was heavy. Letty said she would go down once she could walk, but Duke told her she did not have to. You're lighter than I expected. I can run if you tell me to. Oh. Lighter compared to whom? A former lover, teased Letty. She expected Duke to be flustered, but he did not. He had a ready answer. Compared to carrying three newbies who fainted during training, carrying you is like carrying a kitten on my shoulder. Duke's words were nothing but the plain truth. Letty let out a sigh in his ear. Why was this man so hopeless? I now know why you do not have a lover. Is that so, Duke nonchalantly replied. But, now somehow, I feel like I'd be fine even without one for life. Letty took this as a joke. She volunteered to introduce him to young ladies should he feel like having one. I was surprised you found me. I saw Astrid outside and led me here. Astrid knew she was heading to Mount Gran, but he did not know explicitly where she went. However, he had in him the Sword of White Light Letty granted him. Because of this, he was able to notice Letty's nightly practice with the Sword of Gale Winds, so he was most likely able to point out the source where the Night King's power was being released. He was persistent about coming along, but Sir Oscar stopped him by the entrance, saying he'd only be a burden. What in the world were you doing down here? There is a hot spring here and I wanted to see if I could make it bigger. That's quite an unbelievable excuse coming from you, your highness. I thought so myself. Could you wait a little until I can come up with a better excuse? But then she changed her mind. She knew she had to tell him someday about her and that time had come. It is unfair that you do not know about me and yet he does. Once things have settled down, I will tell you. About what? About several things. But for the first one, I have decided on my third. Duke, without stopping from walking, immediately thought of Astrid. He did not have any negative feelings about it. He had long foreseen such a future. Letty was prepared to accept Astrid once the young knight had made his resolve. And he had accepted this future before. The rivalry he felt for the boy assumed they were both knights of the round anyway. But before that, I have to ask you what is happening outside. How is the evacuation going? They left without any problems. Duke Northruth is a capable man. You can trust him. Letty was now back to being the future queen and was now asking Duke about this and that. Duke knew it was selfish of him, but he silently wished Letty stayed as the delicate and vulnerable princess for a while longer. The next morning, Letty and the others reached the village of the second evacuation site. Letty found giving the explanation about what happened troublesome so she left that task to Oscar. They made up an unbelievable story that Astrid fell from the bridge and got washed away by the river, and then Oscar found and helped him. Then someone from the crowd said that Her Royal Highness was saved because of her everyday kindness, and soon, the general populace believed this. Everyday kindness, huh, flatly whispered Duke, one of the few who was not part of the general populace. But there was no time to be touched by her return. Letty had many things to do. First in the list was transferring of the authority from Craig to her. Then, despite Letty coming up with the decision first, the three countries still needed to undergo the protocol of negotiations and reach an agreement. Once those were completed, she needed to give orders to Salvel's knights. Letty was exhausted and wanted to rest, but after accomplishing all of her tasks, the sun already set. She was only able to deal with personal matters after that. How is Astrid doing? Letty asked Oscar. Astrid was resting in a room the order used as a meeting room. Oscar was staying with him to monitor his health. I am expecting his fever to rise abruptly tonight, but once it breaks, he will be on the road to recovery. He may want to move around after that, so please order him to stay still on his bed for a while. I see. I will order him to recuperate. Astrid would be fine based on Oscar's report. Oscar is a doctor, she doubts he would mix personal feelings with his job. All of her tasks for the day were done. This is the last one left. Oscar kept his word about their truce. Letty affirmed the story about Oscar saving them. He neither threatened Letty's life again nor disturbed the royal knights in performing their tasks in giving help. But Letty was not sure if he would continue this, so she thought of stopping him now. I want you to continue doing your job as a doctor only until we return to the capital. In return, I will keep your involvement in this incident a secret. I do not think this is a bad condition for you. The condition was not just not bad, it was all for Oscar's advantage. To raise a sword against the princess meant going against the kingdom herself. His sin was payable by death. Is it not enough? Then I will also turn a blind eye to Lowenstein's hand in this. Oscar somehow found Letty's condescension a bit annoying. I do not mind an armistice, your highness, instead of a truce. There is also no need for any condition. That was sudden. What is with the change of heart? Oscar was going to kill Letty for Friedhelm's sake. 
This was the reason why Letty kept Lowenstein's involvement a secret. Oscar would not want the trouble about this incident taint Friedhelm's name, since he knew nothing about this plot against her life even though he is at the center of the Lowensteins. Not a change of heart. I just reconsidered the advantages and disadvantages of the situation. Prince Friedhelm needs you. You will definitely help my master when he falls into a predicament. I want you to live for Prince Friedhelm's sake. Oscar probably thought Letty was a kind-hearted person when he saw how she helped Astrid. She could not help but sigh since she thought he was taking her lightly. Let me tell you this. I am willing to kill, even my own brother if it is for the country. You will not. You are a kind person through and through. Besides, the fact that you are searching for a reason to do so means you cannot. Oscar was saying he was doing this for Friedhelm's sake, but his real feelings were deep inside his heart, and there was no need to take notice of it now. I am indebted to you. I shall return it someday. I am not aware when, where, and what debt you incurred. I thought so. But you need not know about it. You help people, not because you are a doctor, but because you are one as well. Letty's words reminded Oscar of the reason why he became a doctor. I used to think that way. I became a doctor because I only wanted to help people. He joined the white doctors for that sole purpose. Every day he waved a white flag as he scorched the battlefield treating the wounded. As time passed, the helping started to feel like something he had to do because he was a doctor. He forgot why he was doing this in the first place and it felt like an obligation. Can he stand again in that same place? He was feeling as light as ever after he threw away the sword. Yes, he could. Please take care of your health, your highness. I now miss the sound of a white flag being blown by the wind, wistfully said Oscar and then looked straight at Letty again. I shall never visit the peaceful Salvel again. This will be farewell. Letty smiled, take care. She understood the meaning Oscar wanted to say to her. He expected Salvel under Letty's reign would be peaceful and would never need the services of the white doctors. Part 3 the faint scent of rain lingered in the air. This might have been the reason why Letty's consciousness was drawn to the Night King's study even though she did not have any plans of going there due to her exhaustion. There was only one king in the study, gunshot King Ledger. He once again smelt of rain and smoke. King Ledger? Water droplets dripped down Ledger as he slowly raised his head. I made it rain. How about you Queen Letitia? You asked me before how to do it. I did as well. I made it rain, but using a different method from what you did. She was not able to call the two winds. She provided enough moisture to the air that was enough to make rain clouds with the help of the magic stone, Irinarung. Fortunately, the moisture was only enough to cover Mount Gran and Mount Stein so there were no casualties due to the rain. Hmm, well, I think I made it rain too much. But I still shot and shot despite it. Twas amazing. An odd light burned in Ledger's amber eyes. The hue resembled the madness that sometimes appears in one-armed King Oswald's eyes. Queen Letitia, do you know what my posthumous title is? I heard it was Gunshot King. Yes. I am the Gunshot King because I did it. I shot and shot with my gun killing all of the enemies. I killed more than Lion King did. I could not believe they surrendered so quickly. Within a moment, Ledger stood up and grabbed Letty's shoulders. The force was so intense that Letty was not able to keep her balance and was pushed down the table. Why? Gunshot King? The gunshot paving the way for the new era? Gunshot King my ass. I am the King of Massacre. Droplets from Ledger's hair fell down to Letty's face. It felt like rain. I dominated them. In my hand was a gun that can even shoot in the rain. Ledger laughed loudly. Letty looked up at him. And I will continue shooting. Because I am a king. Letty felt something warm was mixed in the droplets falling down to her. The power of the Night King is massive. That's why I can make a lot of people suffer. Ledger sounded like he was questioning why he was given such power. But with that same massive power, you can also save many. Because we are kings, replied Letty. You did, Queen Letitia. I know it. But can I? Ledger buried his face into Letty's shoulder, as if he was clinging for his dear life. Letty let out a sigh and gently stroked his hair. Is there no one there to do this for you? No one. If there was, I wouldn't be here. Oh, right. Ledger was also known by a different name, the heartbroken king. He loved someone, but his feelings fell short. If only she were here, why, why did she go? She smiled and told me we'd weather through this together. Ledger was originally not from Salvel. He was Napana's second prince. During his time, Salvel's royal blood was on the verge of extinction. The only young member of the royal family was the daughter of the third queen consort from her first marriage and was adopted by the king. If Salvel would not do anything about it, Salvel would have their first queen who is not of royal blood. To prevent such a future from happening, they wished for the second prince of Napana, a son of a Salvelian princess who married into Napana's royal family to be the husband of Salvel's sole princess. 
they were brought together by forces beyond their control. They met each other once before their wedding. Don't you think we were like two sacrificial lambs offered by our countries? When Ledger told her this, she was surprised. I know things won't be easy for us, but we can go through this together. She smiled and said, yes. But right after her wedding ceremony, she eloped with her lover leaving Ledger behind. But I'm somewhat relieved she never got to experience this feeling. He thought he would never forget her face even after she left him. However, it was starting to blur in his memories and he could only remember the impression her charming smile left on him. His mind was beautifying the events that happened that day. He expected too much from her, that she would be his partner and support for life. There is no God in this world. If there were, the weight of my sins would have killed me long ago. Since I am still alive, it proves there is no God. This was the reason why Ledger no longer prayed. He had to live like this, that this way was correct as a king. He had to, in order to live in this new age. But I'm sure she prays. She thanks God for her happiness today and wishes for it to be the same tomorrow. That's why I think it's fine she will never know about this feeling. I want her to continue on living believing that God exists, whispered Ledger, his voice hoarse and sounded like he was pleading. Letty gently told the probably crying Ledger, someday, I am certain you would meet that one lady who will stay by your side forever. I'm not sure about that. You have a precedent in my family. My great-grandfather was also left by his wife. He thought he would never love again, until he met his new wife. He learned the meaning of true love and lived happily ever after. Ledger slightly shook his shoulder upon hearing the story. Ah, Administrative King Karl Heinz's love story. He always looks so sad when he is here, but whenever I remember he would meet his young and beautiful wife a few years later, I can't force myself to be kind to him. I, on the other hand, have a hard time suppressing my laugh because I keep on remembering his proposal. Happiness once lost would never come back. But even so, there are times it would. This was the hope King Karl Heinz left for them, and Letty was holding on to that hope. She was hoping for a future with her family united as one again. She was working hard to realize that future. Happiness will come to you, definitely. It won't. How many times do you think ladies have rejected me? Then those ladies do not know what they lost. Ledger groaned at Letty's clear declaration to hide his embarrassment. Queen Letitia, make me your lover. I will consider it if you were born before me. The weight pushing her down was gradually lifted. I guess I should go back. I've still got a lot of business to attend to. I have as well. A merry busyness awaits. Letty was preparing to leave when she suddenly remembered something. She asked Ledger about it. King Ledger, if you were asked if there is a god, what would your answer be? Letty wanted to know how Ledger would answer the question Valery Kiryakov of Kielf posed to her. There is no more god in the general sense of the word, but I still think there is. She was the god for me. At least, that's what I think. But even she vanished. However, Ledger still had a different light. Even though there is no more absolute god, the Polaris still shines in the night sky. The northern star, asked Letty. Yes, the star that shines amidst the darkness, never failing to lead the way so I won't get lost. I just realized that I have a lot of people like that beside me. A friend? A retainer? Ledger smiled pleasantly at Letty's question. I look up to them. You don't get it, do you? The great kings of the past born before him, King Alexander, King Karlheinz, Queen Letitia, and King Oswald. The lights they left were Ledger's support. I shall go now. See you, Queen Letitia. Ledger rose up, back to his usual self. He asked Letty to go on a date with him next time and vanished from the Night King's study. Letty slowly rose up as well and whispered, I, too, have a lot of them as well. The person who understands her the most and worries about her. The person she relies on and can act in her stead. The person with complete faith in her. Letty smiled at the happiness surrounding her. Epilogue. Letty was packing up her things to return to the capital to report. The second support party arrived the other day and brought with them a letter personally penned by the king. It says, Strange rumors are circulating in the capital. Some say you were gravely hurt and cannot move. The more outrageous says you died but rose from the dead. Return for now and show everyone that you are safe and sound. However, she still had many things to discuss with Duke Northruth. She had settled all of the urgent matters first and would need to return after clearing up the mess in the capital. I should get some rope, said Letty to herself. Letty went out of the room lent to her and went downstairs. On her way, she met Valerie. He silently stepped aside to let her pass, but the moment she passed by him, he spoke. Is your highness returning to the capital? Yes, but I still have a lot of work to do so I will come back here again. Come back here, repeated Valerie in confirmation. Letty nodded. Among the things left for her to do, the matter about the fourth prince of Kielf was one of the most troublesome. Your highness. Duke Senpai was looking for you, called Astrid. Astrid was not even perturbed by the tensed air surrounding Letty and Valerie. 
with the appearance of another person, Valerie's eyes returned to their dull color and walked away. Letty watched with the corner of her eye as he left and then faced Astrid. Astrid, I have something important to discuss with you once we return to the capital. Something important? Yes, once we are back to the capital. Is your wound already fine? Yes, your highness. Sir Oscar even complimented me. He said even my resilience was that of a monster's. Whether it was a compliment or not was very questionable, but Letty did not have the energy to correct him. She suppressed the desire to roll her eyes and just said, good for you. She then went on downstairs. As Letty continued packing her things, Duke came to her room to make his report. He came in at a good time so Letty made him help with her packing. To whittle away the time, they had some conversation. Letty told Duke about the previous conversation she had with Astrid about her not hating ambitious men and Astrid interpreted it his own way. She flatly refused him and then told him that she would never reciprocate his feelings. Besides, the ambitious man I was referring to was not Duke Northruth, but Lion King Alexander, clarified Letty. But you also like his grace, right, asked Duke as he tightly tied some of the luggage and placed it on the table. Well, I quite like his approach on politics. Duke understood that Letty's quite in this case meant very much. Personally, you around three years ago were more to my liking compared to Duke Northruth. Eh? Your eyes were brimming with determination and ambition to be the commander of the order. Maybe, it was also because of the fact that it was right after you refused Prince Friedhelm's invitation, dashing away your dreams. Wait a second. When did we get acquainted again? Based on what Duke remembered, they first became aware of each other's presence when Letty barged into the main camp of the Royal Chivalric Order and commanded Duke to bow down to her and be her knight. I knew about your name and face when I was eight. I came to know you personally when I was thirteen and you were nineteen. Letty thought about how it was quite a long time ago. I don't remember that. Of course you do not. I suggest you better not ask anything more about it, ended Letty as she changed to a different topic. Do you now feel like making a lover? I know I have already told you before, if you ever feel like it, I will introduce you to some young ladies. Duke understood Letty's resistance in sharing the story so he gave up digging more about their first meeting. He then flatly rejected Letty's offer. Oh, right. I remember you do not have to make any move. Women come flocking to you even without doing anything. Duke Northruth praised you, you know. He said you were not only good-looking, but also highly capable, Letty paused and faced Duke. You do know what will happen if you accept his offer, do you not? Duke determinately said he wouldn't. I want to stay by your side and protect you from everything. I don't feel even a tiny ounce of that towards Duke Northruth. I see, replied Letty. Bring that to the carriage, she ordered Duke, but satisfaction could be clearly heard from her voice. Duke went out of Letty's room to put them into the carriage when he saw Astrid standing by the door. The young lad stared at him, so he asked what was wrong. I will help you carry them, said Astrid as he forcibly took half of the things Duke was carrying and asked his senior this, do you have someone you like, senpai? I don't. I like her highness. Yes, 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 I know, though I have heard that your feelings won't be returned for an eternity. All I can say is good luck. Duke had no plans on interfering with someone's romance. He was about to end the conversation, but Astrid was not yet finished. Is that confidence? What? You normally don't say things like that. I'm sorry, but I heard it. Duke tilted his head to one side, unsure to what those pronouns in Astrid's speech were referring. Astrid stopped walking as he hummed in thought. Or are you unaware? He nodded in conclusion, believing it was the answer he was searching for. I completely did not understand a thing of what you said. I just wanted to say that Her Highness is beautiful and surprisingly cute. Duke thought Astrid's conversation came out of nowhere, but dismissed it since it was nothing new to the boy. I guess she is, sometimes. See? Now, I'm sure about it. Astrid thinks Duke was in love. If you find her cure and want to be with her and protect her, then it could not be anything else but love. The only difference now is whether the person is aware of it or not. As for how to become aware about it, just a single right moment is needed. I see we are truly destined for each other, senpai. Sorry, but I am already sold out about destiny. Besides, I don't feel like we are. Astrid wanted to say they were destined to be rivals, both as a knight and as a man, but his words were not enough so they ended up sounding suspicious. I will not lose, declared Astrid. Your conversation jumped around so much, commented Duke and continued, but I don't plan on losing either. From now on, they would be standing in the same position and would be sharing the same secrets. Duke also thought that he would not lose to Astrid as a knight. Astrid left to complete his own packing after he helped Duke with Letty's things. As Duke watched the young knight go, he whispered, you really are still a kid. Unfortunately, that was not confidence nor unawareness, but an act. Glad you were fooled easily. The right moment happened to him just the other day when she gave him that unguarded smile and thanked him for coming to her. At that moment, his mind went blank and the next thing he knew, he was embracing her tightly. 
Duke knew he was still at that moment, at a tipping point that he was yet to let go. But he was also aware that it was only a matter of time until things progressed on their own.